Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here for our 10th annual Transfer to Excellence Research Symposium. We are uh, really honored that you're here to support our interns today and hopefully for our event tomorrow. Just a little bit of background. This was, um, of course, another year affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And while many research internships canceled their programs last year, we were able to run a pilot remote program of just a few interns, which prepared us for another year online. And this summer we hosted our biggest cohort yet with 19 interns all logging in on Zoom every day, uh, supported by 19 mentors and 17 different UC Berkeley research centers. And by many measures, this year's intern cohort was also our most diverse ever. So um, you can see both some of our interns and our mentors on the slide. Our interns today were all supported by the National Science Foundation Research Experiences for Undergraduates program. So we're really grateful for that program, which funds uh, opportunities for students to try research while they're undergrads. And our program was hosted by the Center for Energy Efficient Electronic Science. Just some quick logistics. Today's meeting is being recorded so that uh, our interns can share it with their community after the fact. We have, I think, muted all audience members to prevent Zoom bombing. But every presentation will be followed by a short amount of time for Q&A. And we really encourage you to engage with our interns, to ask them about their research. And um, you can do that either by unmuting yourself or putting your questions in the chat. And so a quick preview of today's presentations. We'll get started in just a minute with Jesse followed by Miriam, David, Isaac, and Kara. We'll then take a short break, followed by Christina, Rocco, Darren, Adam, and Jacob. And we are so grateful to the graduate student and postdoc mentors who have supported the students in these projects, and also the faculty hosts who have hosted the students. So with that, I think Jesse might be ready to take it away. Awesome. Good. Hello, everyone. Can everybody see my slides? Yep. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 UC Berkeley Transfer to Excellence Research Symposium. My name is Jesse Horowitz, and I'm a mechanical engineering student from Cuesta College. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. The research my mentor and I performed during this summer focused on pump probe measurements of coherent phonons in germanium, gallium arsenide, and molybdenum disulfide. First, let's get some background knowledge on phonons. So you may be asking yourself, what are phonons? Phonons can be described as an atomic vibration. Coherent phonons have received an impulse from an outside source, which causes them to move at the same pace as their neighboring atoms. In-phase vibrations versus out-of-phase vibrations are the difference between coherent phonons and incoherent phonons. This difference is shown in the provided illustration. Here's a basic illustration of what is happening in a pump probe measurement system. An initial laser pulse, referred to as the pump pulse, seen in green, strikes a sample and causes coherent phonons to propagate through the material. A time-delayed laser pulse called the probe pulse, seen in red, is sent after the pump pulse and strikes the sample and is then reflected back to a photodetector. In short, the pump pulse causes a sudden increase in temperature and the pulse pulse detects that reaction. The benefit of a pump probe measurement technique is that it is a form of non-destructive material testing. Here is more detail about what is happening with the pump pulse. This ultra-fast frequency modulated laser pulse is absorbed and causes the reflectivity and refractive index in our sample materials to modulate. The pump pulse is responsible for generating the coherent phonons that are analyzed in this research. 
Here's some more details on the probe pulse. This laser pulse is responsible for detecting the coherent phonons generated from the pump pulse. It also strikes the material like the pump pulse, but instead of being absorbed into the material, it is reflected back to a photodetector. A lock-in amplifier is used to record the phase and magnitude of these signals. These signals are seen as a clear oscillatory signal, which we use to examine for our research. The goal of our research is to better understand the oscillatory signal of coherent phonons generated by our pump probe measurement technique and compare our results with those based on established material properties. Understanding phonon behavior and the interaction between phonons are important to understanding the thermal and electrical properties in a material. We aim to identify trends in our measured results as a function of laser power, wavelength, or other properties and, compare, and use these to help better understand the properties of phonons in, in our sample materials. The research performed by Kasami proved that observing the oscillatory signal caused by the absorption of a laser pulse has led to obtaining the longitudinal sound velocity, the extinction coefficient, and the refractive index in their sample materials without the need for any other material parameters. Later in this presentation, we will go over how we derived equation from Kasami's research to measure longitudinal sound velocity in the extinction coefficient in our sample materials. To begin our analysis, we need raw data. The phase and magnitude of the oscillatory signal are used to analyze the coherent phonons. Here is an example of these signals. The phase data is shown on the left and the magnitude data on the right. The y-axis is the phase in degrees for the phase data and the magnitude in volts for the magnitude data. The x-axis is the same for both graphs and is the delay time in picoseconds. A picosecond is one trillionth of a second, so all this is happening very quickly. Our main focus in this data is the oscillatory signal. To better analyze this oscillation, we have to ignore the initial impulse seen in the data. We remove the first 20 picoseconds for the phase data and the first 10 picoseconds of the magnitude data. If we do not remove this impulse, our coding software does not produce a worthy fit. The phase and magnitude data are analyzed by fitting to this simple mathematical model shown here. These fit parameters are used to identify material properties as well as finding trends in our measured results as a function of laser power, wavelength, and other properties. Here on the left is an example of the time chop phase data seen in blue with our fit overlaid seen in orange. The equation mentioned in the previous slide is used to generate the fit curve. The graph on the right shows the residuals, which is the difference between the data and the model. The residuals are generated from subtracting the fit from the data. Here is an example of our time chop magnitude data, also seen in blue, with our orange fit overlaid. The residuals of this graph are shown on the right. The magnitude data is fit using the same equation as the phase data. These fit curves generate parameters that we can use to identify material properties in our sample materials. We were able to fit and analyze over 40 curves during this eight week period. Using the period of oscillation fit parameter seen in red and a tabulated refractive index value seen in blue, we were able to measure a longitudinal sound velocity value in germanium, gallium arsenide, and molybdenum disulfide using the equation shown here derived from Kasami's research. Here, you can see our average experimental longitudinal sound velocity in our sample materials compared to their tabulated values. We see a close correlation in gallium arsenide in germanium, but MOS2 is pretty far off. This could be caused by our sample material having a different orientation than the tabulated model. The orientation of a material can have a major effect on its longitudinal sound velocity. It's worth noting that these cap values came from using the phase data, but virtually the same values were obtained when analyzing the magnitude data. Using the damping time fit parameter seen in red and a tabulated longitudinal sound velocity seen in blue, we were able to use Kasami's research to derive an expression to measure the extinction coefficient. As you can see from this data, 
germanium was close to its tabulated value, while gallium arsenide and MOS2 were pretty far away. This could be that we are measuring a different material property that is related to the scattering of coherent phonons. These values came from analyzing the phase data. The magnitude data produced values that were even further away from their tabulated values. Future analysis will need to be performed to determine what material properties we are analyzing. Here, we can see our oscillation amplitude versus pump power trend. In germanium, we observe that as we increase the pump power, the oscillation amplitude of our signal also increases. Basically, as we put more power into the sample, the reaction from the sample increases as well. This is observed in both the phase and the magnitude data. The y-axis of these graphs are the oscillation amplitude in degrees for the phase data on the left and the oscillation amplitude in volts for the magnitude data on the right. The x-axis is the pump power in milliwatts for both graphs. The dampening time versus modulation frequency trend seen here are opposite between materials and have us somewhat confused as to why. We anticipated at low modulation frequency, the sample would have low damping times and at high frequency would have much higher damping times. Our theory matches with the germanium graph on the left, but is the opposite in the molybdenum disulfide graph on the right. This correlation between damping time and modulation frequency is definitely something that can be explored with further research. The y-axis for both graphs is the damping time in picoseconds, and the x-axis is the modulation frequency in megahertz. It's worth noting that this correlation is only observed in the phase data. To wrap things up, during this presentation, we covered how we used a pump probe measurement technique to generate and measure the oscillatory signal of coherent phonons. We used a fitting equation to generate fitting parameters to be used to help find trends in our sample materials. We were able to measure longitudinal sound velocity values and an extinction coefficient value that was close to their tabulated properties, as well as analyzing what may be causing their differences. We learned that the oscillation amplitude of our signal increases with pump power. In the future, more research needs to be done to determine what material property we are measuring instead of the extinction coefficient. More analysis needs to be performed to determine what is causing the correlation and differences between the damping time and modulation frequency in our sample materials. I would like to thank my faculty advisor, Dr. Wu, for allowing me to conduct research with the Wu Group. Thank you to my mentor, Sarah Warkander, for her guidance and help throughout the summer. I want to thank the National Science Foundation, as well as the TTE staff and participants. A big thank you goes to my family for their constant support, and especially to my brother, Luke, who is always a phone call away from me. Here are the list of references I used in my performance. I would like to thank you all for listening to my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I have a quick question, Jesse, based on the uh, pump probing. I believe it sure. was the beginning of your presentation. Yep. Um, does that operate under a certain wavelength or can you use any wavelength for those? Uh... Yes, the wavelength can be adjusted. Our, I think our pump pulse was at uh, like 500 nanometers and uh, our pro pulse was at 800. Got it, thank you. Yep. I also have a quick question regarding like the material that you used throughout the study. Why sure. would you choose those three specific materials and not something else? Yeah, these three materials were chosen because they're semiconductors. And uh, my mentor had already begun research with these materials. So it was natural for me to pick up where she left off. Any other questions? Jesse, what surprised you most about 
either this project or the research process? I think just how much work goes into it. I think a lot of it, you know, you could spend a whole day doing something that doesn't work out. And that's kind of a different mentality that I had to learn to adapt to. Any final questions for Jesse? Well done. Way to set us off really strong. Thank you. Next up, we have Miriam. Hello, everyone. My name is Miriam. I'm from Sacramento City College. And this summer, I was working with the Chakra Board to Youth Research Group in the 2021 TTE program. Specifically, I was looking at the enrichment of subsurface microbes with different carbon substrates. Now, uh, before I start, I wanted to give a sort of outline on what I'm going to be talking about today. So firstly, I'll go into the background of carbon cycling, soil organic matter, and microbes role in these essential components. Then I'll go into the specifics of my project and the results that were generated through it. So I wanted to include this picture because firstly, I thought it looked really cool. And secondly, I thought it would be a great introduction into the field of soil microbiology. Now, soil is something that we see every day, but don't really think about its complexity. Even within the scientific field, there's still so many unknowns. And that's mainly due to the fact that the majority of research has been conducted on the rhizosphere, which is the portion of soil in which microbes directly interact with plant roots. So that is this region here. And what scientists are finding out is that um, microbial activity is not restricted to this region. And that's what my project tackles. The reason why we're so interested in soil is because of the many functions that it serves, such as carbon cycling. The carbon cycling basically refers to the pathway that carbon takes from where it's produced for the carbon source and where it gets stored or utilized, which is the carbon sink. And the process of long-term capture and storage of carbon is called carbon sequestration. And this is necessary to mitigate any uh, negative threats or consequences of climate change. I wanted to include this diagram because I thought it did a great job of simplifying the carbon cycle. So if we start here, we see that soil organisms release carbon dioxide through respiration. The plants then take in this carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, convert it into carbohydrates, which are secreted back to the soil. The same soil organisms then consume these carbohydrates and convert them back into carbon dioxide through respiration and we start the cycle once again. Soil organic matter is a more technical term for soil. It is the largest terrestrial carbon pool or sink, and it may be derived from plant exudates or secretions, decomposing material like plant litter, um, chemical transformations conducted by soil microbes and the microbes themselves. Now microbes are especially important components because they facilitate the sun's um, production and also greatly influence the efficiency of carbon sequestration. Now that we've got some of the background down, I can get into my specific area of research this summer, which was to investigate the influence of carbon source and soil depth on a microbial community composition. To do this, an auger was used to collect soil cores at a different depth site at Oak Ridge Field Research Center. And the depths were chosen based on associated metagenomic data, where we saw high activity of methanogens and nitrate reducers. Then the sediments from each core were used as an inoculum source in customized media, which I'll get into in the next slide. And if you see the diagram on the right side, this is what inoculum cores um, 
just to explain like the depths that they were taken at. So this table lists all of the different samples that were collected, as well as the enrichment conditions that were created. And what this means is um, enrichment conditions basically describe the environments that were created in order to select for specific microbes. And the microbes that we were selecting for were ones that used either nitrate ions or methane molecules as their primary terminal electronic acceptors. And this basically means that we wanted to isolate microbes that use nitrate or methane as their um, primary uh, precursor to um, generating ATP. Now the inoculum source, as mentioned in the last slide, basically refers to the soil, soil core ID. So the first two digits correspond to the soil depth in meters, and the second two digits correspond to the um, segments from each of those meters. And the substrates refer to the chemicals that were uh, fed to the microbes to isolate them. So now that we collected the samples, it was time to sequence them and analyze them. To do this, we used a process called 16S amplicon sequencing, which is a technique that's used to differentiate between the different OTUs, which are operational taxonomic units, in a sample. The 16S RNA gene is typically looked at because it's shared across most microbes, so it's easy to identify discrepancies in their sequences, and therefore it's easy to um, differentiate between microbes. And the CHIME2 package was used for analysis, and I'll explain that using this flowchart. So you start off with your raw sequences, typically in the form of FASTAC data files. You then demultiplex them, which is the process of separating your sequences and pairing them up with the samples that they came from. This process is um, necessary because oftentimes your samples can uh, different sequences mixed up together. So you do need to make sure that each, each sequence goes with each sample. From there, you can create a feature table or representative sequences to do statistics or taxonomy classifications. And taxonomy is the evolutionary history of microbes. Now for the results that were generated, we were able to create a relative abundance plot using CHIME. And this is what you see here. We decided to look at the top 10 most abundant microbes at the sixth taxonomic level, which is basically the genus level. And if you look at the X axis, this is the samples, and the Y um, corresponds to the microbial composition. And going back to the table that was shown, each of these rows corresponds to each of these bars. And in the next slide, uh, we see the key that tells us which taxon each of these colors corresponds to. So if we begin from the first sample, we see a large portion of this dark blue color. Now this color corresponds to the family Podospirillaceae, which are a group of anaerobic nitrogen fixing bacteria. And if we look at the enrichment condition that they were placed in, um, we can see why uh, we would have such a high quantity of nitrogen fixing bacteria. The reason why we see a lack of biodiversity, though, is most likely due to the fact that the substrate that was used was too harsh for other microbes to survive. Now, looking at the next sample, uh, the main difference between this one and the rest of them, if we look at the soil cores they were taken from, we see that it was from the shallowest soil depth. So what this tells us is that um, at this step, we still have oxygen present. And because of that, um, we can expect to have aerobic microbes at this depth. And that proved to be true because both of the microbes that we found were aerobic bacteria. Now, looking at the last four samples, we see that they have roughly similar microbial populations, but at different compositions. This could be due to the fact that different substrates were used for these samples, or if we look back at the soil cores, it could be 
because two different soil cores were used. Now, um, although they were taken at the same soil core depth, they were, they were still two separate locations. So just by chance, it's likely that um, you will have a difference in initial microbial communities because they're from two separate locations. So the main takeaways from this project was that some of the factors that contribute to final microbial composition are soil depth, the chemistry associated with the enrichment substrate, and the microbial composition of the initial soil core. Looking forward, we, help, we hope that um, this field of research helps us to un understand microbial community members that mediate subsurface carbon transformation. This would help to improve our estimates of microbial impact and global carbon stocks and fluxes. Here are my references. I'd like to thank my mentor, Christine Kabugao, for all her help and guidance this summer. I'd also like to thank Moon Uyi, who volunteered her samples for me to use. I'd like to thank my PI, Ami Chakraborty, and all of the um, Berkeley Lab Research Group. And also, I'd also like to give a special thank you to all of the TTE staff and cohort, namely Nicole, Tony, and Sam. This project was funded by the National Science Foundation, so a special thank you to them and to E3S. And finally, thanks to you for hearing me ramble about my research. <laughs> if there's any questions, I'll, I'll try my best to answer them. I have a question, Miriam. Yeah. Which of which of which of the top ten most found microbes in your in your soil samples did you find most interesting? Ooh, okay, let me go back. Um, I thought the the ones at the shallow shallow was were the most interesting because we um, didn't find significant traces of those at other sample oh at other soil core depths. So I thought those were interesting. I'm a, a little bit curious, towards the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that most of the research on um, microbes in soil is done like kind of on the very top layer of soil, like where the microbes are directly interacting with the plant roots. Um, I'm kind of curious why that is. Is it just because like those are the easiest soil cores to sample or is there maybe like another reason there? Well, it's mostly because um, we expect there to be more microbes interacting with plant roots than in bulk soil, which is where plant roots don't reach. Um, so people were mostly studying the spheric um, bacteria because they um, wanted to study their potential as symbionts, so like um, their relationship with plants. So um, it was kind of like, like groundbreaking that they found microbes where there are no other like uh, plants for them to help out. I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah, that made sense. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Mariam, we've got a question in the chat from Gustavo, which is, do you feel that future research is needed? I do feel like future research is needed, especially because um, we, um, for my project um, in particular, we didn't look at many samples for many deaths. So more research is needed, I think, um, just to see if other carbon sources would have an impact on microbial communities and possibly even deeper soil cores. Um, I think I saw a question from my dad. <laughs> Can we change the bacteria composition for better plant outcome? Yes, we can. Um, th this is um, probably, we can't do this yet because there's still a lot of research that, that needs to be done. But um, some of the things, uh, well, the prospects of this field are to um, promote the growth of more nitrogen fixing bacteria or microbes in soil. Uh, this is necessary because uh, plants can't use nitrate from the environment, 
So um, they need microbes to convert that into forms that plants can use. So if we increase the microbial population that can do nit um, nitrogen fixing, then we can possibly help to import more of that nitrogen that plants can use into the soil. Well, Miriam, I have a quick question. Uh, and I know it was not, you know, as part of your main studies, but do you have any um, idea how the, you know, the current drought that we have now for, for years and years, especially here in the West, uh, impacts you know, microbial composition or, or concentration? I would imagine that it does influence them, but uh, maybe my mentor, Christine, can help to give more, more information on that. Hi, yes. So there are uh, many studies that are looking at comparing microbial communities between different land uses. So for example, pre-agriculture or pre-fertilization as opposed to what happens afterwards. And we do see changes in microbial communities because of those, you could call them disturbance events <laughs> or just changes in the conditions in which the microbes are growing. So people are looking into that. And there are even some studies where people have looked at the soil underneath asphalt, like on roads, to see what happens to the microbes after we pour concrete and asphalt. Like, what is the what is the consequence of that? And we do see differences in what functions the microbial communities are able to do. So we want to encourage the functions that we consider beneficial, whether that that means they're increasing plant growth or increasing carbon cycling or something like that. So there is a change of function, and so that wasn't. Um, um, directly part of this research, but that is um, ongoing. And Miriam is very correct in saying that there are stark differences between what we would call natural microbial communities from the ecosystem versus microbial communities from more um, human-centric areas. Thank you. Very but nice. great answer to the question, Miriam. Thank you. Um, I also saw a question on where these samples were taken from. So they were from a field site at Oak Ridge Field Research Center. Uh, Christine, do you know where exactly that is? Yeah, so this is right outside of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And so there are GPS coordinates for this particular site, but I do not have them off the top of my head. But yes, they are um, by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Okay, my final question is, Miriam, would you like to share what you're doing over the next year? Oh, I will be starting my junior year at UC Berkeley in environmental science. So this, this project really goes in line with that. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. Well, well done, Miriam, and thank you, everyone, for your great questions. With that, we are going to move on to David Bellman. All right, uh, let's see. Can everyone see my screen all right? Looks good. Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is David Bellman. And for this summer, I performed research on memory optimization for delay-based optoelectronic reservoir computing. So first let's go into a quick introduction on uh, neural networks. So. Neural networks are found everywhere in today's tech-driven world. Uh, I have some examples here for us. So for instance, YouTube uses uh, their own proprietary neural network to recommend you videos you might enjoy watching. Uh, similarly, Spotify uses their own neural network system uh, to recommend you songs and even curate playlists based on songs and artists you've recently been listening to. And last but not least, uh, Amazon also uses their own neural network system to recommend you different products you might enjoy purchasing based on your recent purchase history. So one of the uh, biggest drawbacks to using uh, modern neural network systems is that they do take lots of time to train. Uh, they are very complex systems. And not only are they very complex, but they're also very expensive to initially set up. So I talked a little bit about uh, these modern neural networks. 
Uh, these modern neural networks are known as convolutional neural networks. And essentially how these neural networks work is you have lots of nodes, physical nodes here, and they're all interconnected. Um, and so you will be inputting data throughout the nodes and uh, you will eventually receive an output. Uh, but throughout the entirety of this system, uh, there's something else occurring called backpropagation training. And so what backpropagation training is, uh, essentially they are incorporating the usage of convolutional layers. Um, this is essentially a sort of edge detection technology or extracting features from an image uh, to just kind of get a uh, pattern. So for instance, if you ran several images of the number five through uh, the system, it might learn a general pattern to what the number five looks like. Um, and so it'll pass through the entirety of the system and then you'll eventually receive an output here. Um, one of the big drawbacks to a convolutional neural network is that, like I said before, they do take up a lot of time uh, to train them because this backpropagation training occurs throughout the entirety of the system. So a way we can kind of get around having to um, train the entirety of the system is by using something called a reservoir computing. So the way reservoir computing works is you will input the data through some randomized mask, and then this data will go into our system where it'll uh, be analyzed through a series of virtual nodes. So these aren't actual physical components, rather they're being uh, simulated by our system. And once a node reaches, or once the data reaches a node um, and is um, very much aligned with uh, what the node is expecting to see, it'll uh, send out an output to your system. And so this system is very appealing to us, not only because uh, it's much simpler, but because it's computing time is also greatly reduced. Here we have a uh, chart showing the amount of uh, data processing, or I should say training time, uh, compared to the number of nodes of a uh, reservoir computing system here. And here is a state-of-the-art convolutional neural network system uh, training time here. And this is in seconds, and the number of nodes here uh, listed on the x-axis. As you can see here, the uh, number of nodes, so you know, we can start off here at 1,000 nodes all the way up to 10,000 nodes. Um, they tend to follow more or less a linear progression here uh, with their trend in uh, increase in training time. Um, because these nodes are randomly initialized, uh, they just need to be randomly trained. From those, or well, I, I guess there's essentially no training going on. They're randomly initialized. Um, and for the convolutional neural network system here, uh, they do require training and they're not dependent on differing number of nodes because the convolutional neural network system here uh, has a fixed amount of physical nodes. So my research uh, implemented the usage of hybrid reservoir computing systems. So what this essentially is, is taking the best of both worlds here from uh, modern convolutional neural networks and uh, standard reservoir computing systems. So our hybrid reservoir computing system makes use of several convolutional layers. Um, in my experiments, we use two convolutional layers to just get a uh, feature map of the data that was being inputted. It's then sent through a mask that is randomized and then the data is uh, run across the series of virtual nodes where we will then eventually receive an output. So going a bit more into depth of the system, uh, data is inputted into our computer board. This is a uh, off the shelf computer board. There's nothing special about it. Uh, it is known as a field programmable gate array. Um, this electrical signal of the data is then sent through a driver and into a laser modulator uh, where, is where it is converted from a electrical signal, which is here in red, 
into an optical signal here in blue. And this data will run through this optical fiber cable. And the length of this optical fiber cable is uh, actually of great interest to us. So the length of this cable determines the uh, time delay of our system. And so that is denoted here by this little uh, Greek symbol here, tau. And so the longer the time delay, uh, essentially the longer time the system has to think about the information it is receiving. Um, so after the data is ran through its time delay, or I should say its uh, fiber optic cable, it is then converted back into an electrical signal where it is outputted back to a computer. So my research question was, uh, does time delay affect reservoir computing image classification tasks? And so to answer this question, I ran several hundreds of simulations uh, on something called the Savio cluster, which is essentially a supercomputer uh, made available to us by UC Berkeley. And we ran it using the MNIST data set here. Uh, here in the bottom right corner, you can see that I have a sample image of what you might find in the MNIST data set. Uh, essentially, the MNIST data set consists of tens of thousands of uh, grayscale, low resolution scans of hand drawn numbers ranging from one to nine. Um, and so, using that database, uh, coupled with some Python code that we wrote to emulate the physical system. Uh, we were able to run both of these through the Savio cluster, like I mentioned before, and determine the performance of our system uh, relative to an initialized tau value. And now this is a normalized tau value. So what this means is it's letting us know how many nodes uh, coupled together uh, before the system is refreshed. Um, so as you can see here, there was a lot of noise uh, in our simulations and we ran several different, uh, we ran simulations with varying initial parameters. And um, yeah, we noticed that the uh, time delay does not seem to significantly affect the performance of our system. Um, though there does seem to be some opportunity here to perhaps op further optimize and uh, perhaps stabilize the accuracy of our uh, system. And as you can see as well, uh, we are very close to uh, reaching or even surpassing uh, the accuracy of uh, modern convolutional neural network system. And so we ran additional simulations using the CIFAR-10 data set. And again, this data set consists of tens of thousands of images. Uh, here at the bottom right, I have a sample image. So this is a low resolution colored image of a frog. Uh, the CIFAR-10 data set consists of several, uh, I guess you could call them classifications of images. So for example, just a couple of them would be uh, cars, trucks, planes, frogs. Um, they're all colored images. They're all low resolution. Um, and here you can see our system did not perform as well. This in fact was the first time that we ran our scheme using the CIFAR-10 data set. Um, and again, you can see that even with the varying number of uh, normalized values for tau and varying numbers of nodes, listed by the varying uh, plots here, that again, the tau value does not seem to significantly affect uh, the accuracy of our system. And we are still a ways away from uh, rivaling modern convolutional neural network systems. So just in summary, um, altering the time delay of our scheme did not seem to significantly affect the performance of our system. And so for future research, we would be very much interested in further reducing the amount of noise uh, in our data. We would also be interested in investigating how other components of our memory in our scheme uh, affect 
our accuracy. So for instance, uh, here the low pass filter, uh, this determines uh, how many nodes can essentially communicate with each other uh, for each uh, cycle, I guess, of the system. And so we would also be interested in running further simulations with other data sets. Uh, that way we can see uh, perhaps where some downfalls are to our system and how we can improve it and further optimize it for uh, certain data sets. And we would also be interested in attempting uh, video recognition with our scheme. And so I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Philip Jacobson, uh, for guiding and supporting me throughout the entirety of uh, my summer research. I would also like to give a big thanks to Professor Ming Si Wu uh, for allowing me to be a part of his lab. Uh, a big thank you to E3S or the Center for Energy Efficient Electronic Sciences uh, for hosting the program, as well as the National Science Foundation for, for funding all of us. And here are some of the references I used throughout the entirety of my slides. And are there any questions? Hey, David. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, can you um, tell me a little bit? So what was striking on the data that you showed was it seems that if you do a um, thousand nodes, you, you, know, you, are, you consistently have quite a lot lower performance than when you go to 2000. But once you're at 2000, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference anymore, even if you go up to 10,000. Um, right. Is this simply the you know the the setup the system that you use is basically optimized at let's say two to three thousand nodes and it, it wouldn't help you a lot anymore to go to higher numbers or is do you see that there is still you know improvement that you can do I don't know by changing uh, the approach um, algorithm wise that you take full advantage of, of, of a higher number of nodes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure if I understood the question you were asking. From my understanding, you're asking if the number of nodes is of big significant significance to the accuracy. Is that correct? To some extent, yeah. When you, when you look at this number here, clearly 2,000 nodes are, I think, even statistically lower performing than when you go to 2,000, 3,000 nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it doesn't seem that there's a lot of improvement anymore because you're just in the statistical noise between about two, 3,000 and all the way up to 10,000 nodes. Right. So the reason why we uh, ran several simulations across uh, varying node parameters is uh, just out of sheer curiosity. We've uh, never really done so uh, changing the tau value and we were interested in uh, perhaps how much noise or the lack thereof uh, there would be. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, I will also be checking the chat. Uh, I have a quick question. Oh, yeah. Sap, you can go ahead if you want. Oh, I was just going to ask um, really quickly, does, could this same research be applied to, uh, for example, neural networks that are generating images or audio or text? Um, I'm sorry, you, you were doing images, but um, yeah, could, could this be like kind of cross applied to other types of generated data like text? Um, yeah, I believe there, uh, the literature has shown that uh, reservoir computing systems, I'm not sure about hybrid uh, reservoir computing systems, but Standard reservoir computing systems have been used to do uh, closed captioning for things like TV. Okay, cool. Uh, Tony, I believe you also had a question. Yes, um, I have a question. Why would you, in your scheme, why did you convert electrical signal to optical oh. signal and then, re and then convert it back to electrical signal? Would there be any risk of data loss by converting one signal to the other? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not too sure on whether there is any data loss. Um, I could get back to you on that perhaps after the presentation. Um, but the reason why we converted the uh, data from an electrical to an optical signal here is so that we could make use of the uh, optoelectronic component here, which was uh, 
using a laser and modulating its intensity uh, in order to create a time delay. The time delay is uh, pretty standard in reservoir computing systems. Thank you. Mm -hmm. David, we've got a question oh. from the chat, which okay. is, how is the accuracy of image recognition determined? Yeah, so the accuracy of image recognition is uh, essentially determined by uh, your com or the system being inputted kind of a master key. And then of all the images and what kind of classification they are and all that. And so then the cluster computer ran its simulation and um, classified all of the images and uh, what it thought was their respective uh, order or grouping, I should say. And then that grouping was then compared to the uh, master key that was given. And then by that, we can determine the accuracy of our simulations. Hey, hey, David, um, what did you use to create this figure? Yeah, um, this figure, so I recorded my data in uh, Microsoft Excel, and this figure was just one of the standard uh, options for displaying the data. So I believe this was the uh, several line graphs option. All right, are there any other questions? Oh, yep, we just got one in the chat from Kayvon, which is how come you were using Python and not a low level programming language such as C or C++? Wouldn't Python be incredibly slow for running hundreds of simulations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I believe the reason we used Python was uh, one for the uh, breadth of libraries that are available to us in order to leverage for these simulations and just make the coding work easier. Um, additionally, I believe, I can't remember off the top of my head, but some of the libraries we used uh, are actually coded in C and C++. So we're implementing the usage of these low level languages um, in our libraries, which helps uh, speed up our computation times. Awesome. Well done. And good job answering questions, David. You had a lot thrown at you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. All right. We are going to move along to Isaac. Isaac, are you ready? Yes, I am. Let me get my screen up and I will share it. All right, can everyone see my screen just fine? Looks good. Yep. Excellent, all right. So uh, let me minimize my Zoom link so I'm not staring at myself talk, that's kind of awkward. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Isaac Via Lawyer, and I've had the privilege of working in Dr. Sujay Kinglu's lab with my mentor, Lars P. Tatum, on designing and optimizing oscillatory nano-electromechanical switches. Now, these switches can be used to solve combinatorial optimization problems, or COPs, which are mathematical problems that involve finding the optimal solution from a finite set and can be notoriously difficult to solve in certain iterations. The above cartoon shows one example of a COP, the traveling salesman problem, which involves finding the shortest possible route between a set of cities where the traveler visits each city exactly once and must return to their starting location. Now, the traveling salesman problem is just one classic example of a COP, but COPs are fundamental in a staggeringly wide range of application areas from finance to circuit design to drug discovery. Many of the hardest COPs can actually be mapped onto a different kind of mathematical model called an icing model, which has been extensively studied and have unique uh, universalities which reflect the magnetic spin state of a network of nodes. Now, the reason this is important is because icing machines are physical systems that can find the local solution to these icing problems. And thus, they're able to solve COPs that are mapped onto those icing models to start out with. We propose the implementation of a nano-electromechanical, or NEM, switch using CMOS back-end-of-line metal layers 
as the building block for such an icing machine, because it allows for the cost-effective hybridization of CMOS and NEMS circuits, which can achieve orders of magnitude greater energy efficiency than pure CMOS implementations. In this work, oscillatory NEM operational characteristics are explored to enable an optimal energy and performance balance. Isaac, I just want to confirm. Okay, we were worried that your slides weren't progressing. Oh, no, I, I apologize. Also, I can't see the chat, so if there's something, just uh, please reach out. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick outline of what the presentation is going to consist of. We'll start with an introduction and background into uh, oscillatory uh, systems and icing models. Then we'll talk about the general operational characteristics of NEM oscillators. Next, we'll go into design optimization of our specific oscillators. Then we'll go into some of the electrical and mechanical characteristics that came out of our simulations regarding these switches. We'll talk about next steps for future, re uh, for future research. And finally, we'll have a summary of the most important parts of the research. So nonlinear oscillators like our NEM switches can be hooked up in a network like the one shown, and these networks can be parameterized to reflect specific icing problems. In the on state, the oscillators will line up in a phase that represents the optimal solution to the icing problem, and in this way solve the combinatorial optimization problem that has been mapped onto the icing model. First, let's explore the general operational principles of NEM switches, and then take a look at some specific characteristics for oscillation. So in general, three distinct forces act during the operation of any NEM switch. The first is the electrostatic force, uh, which in this is F elect, and this acts to pull the beam into contact with the contact electrode. Next, we have the restoring force, or FK, which acts to pull the beam in the opposite direction of the electrostatic force and return it to its neutral position. The contact adhesive force causes the movable beam to stick to the contact electrode once contact is made and is one of the main constraints in a NEM system. If the contact adhesive force is greater than the uh, spring restoring force, then the beam in the contact electrode will remain connected regardless of the electrostatic force that's applied to it, unless some additional force is applied in the opposite direction to push it back to its neutral position. This is called a non-volatile operation where the beam sticks to the contact electrode. Now, for our devices, we want the opposite of this. We want volatile operation because we want our device to return back to normal once a certain voltage threshold is reached. A fundamental component of our oscillatory NEM devices is that they only require a DC input to oscillate. They're self-sustaining oscillators. In the above diagrams, the drain node is labeled as D1, the gate node as G1, and the source beam as SB. The device is first primed with a steady DC gate voltage, creating an electrostatic force between the source beam and the gate. This force bends the source beam towards the gate and the drain, but it is not strong enough to actually cause the beam to make contact with the drain. It's key that throughout operation, the beam will never make contact with the gate node, and so the gate node, G1, will never be discharged. Now, once the relay is turned on by pulsing a voltage at the drain, which increases the total electrostatic force acting on the beam past a critical threshold, and it pulls the beam into contact with the drain. Now, as the source beam makes contact with the drain and discharges, the electrostatic force induced by the drain disappears because it's discharging through the drain. The gate-induced electrostatic force alone is insufficient to keep the relay on. The beam snaps back to its equilibrium position and the relay turns off. But once the relay is in the off state, the electrostatic force between the drain and the beam begins to build again. This causes the relay to turn back on, the cycle to repeat, and this is how oscillation occurs. For our specific device, we utilize a vertical back end of line or BEOL design for the NEM oscillating relays. Now, figure A shows the back end of line portion of an integrated circuit. Now, a back end of line portion normally contains the metal interconnect that's used to connect the CBOS transistors located at the front end of line portion, which is at the bottom of the IC. The design model is chosen because it allows for a highly compact array of switches to be monolithically integrated with front end of line CMOSFETs. This basically just means it's stacked on top of them, creating an entire optimization circuit on a single chip. These devices have an area density that is over 10,000 times the previous oscillatory MEM models that are used. By using multiple back end of line layers to form the vertically oriented movable electrode beam, compact CMOS and NEMS circuits can be achieved with a conventional CMOS manufacturing process, minimal additional processing, and minimal additional cost. 
An oscillatory NEM device operates properly only when the electrostatic force, the spring restoring force, and the adhesive force are balanced properly. The equation in the top right hand corner of this slide shows this balancing. The combined electrostatic force created from the drain source voltage difference and gate source voltage difference must be stronger than the spring restoring force so that the beam can bend and make contact. However, once the contact is made, the adhesion force between the contact and the beam and the electrostatic force between the gate source voltage difference must be less than the spring restoring force so that the beam will release from its contact and the drain will return to normal. The physical dimensions of the vertical back end of line relay are integral because they influence the strength of these forces that act in the device's operation. So here we see that the spring restoring force depends on the length of the beam, the width of the beam, and the thickness of the beam, as well as the structural material of the beam. For our simulations, we simulated with copper. The adhesion force depends on the contact area between the beam and the drain, and the contact material because of asperities that are created in the in the surface of the material through the manufacturing process. Lastly, the electrostatic force depends on the actuation area between the beam, the gate, and the beam and the drain, as well as the actuation gap between the beam and the gate and the beam and the drain. That's basically the distance between the beam and the electrode surface. And then lastly, it depends on the voltages between the gate, the beam, and the drain and the beam. Under these constraints, a vertical back end of line NEM switch was designed with a contact area of 660 square nanometers, beam to drain gap of 18 nanometers, and beam to gate gap of 20 nanometers. Unlike previous back end of line NEM models, our seven nanometer node oscillatory NEM only requires one side for operation. And you can see that here. We take the most compact approach by eliminating the additional gate and drain entirely, which is why you see a beam in the center and only one gate and drain combination on the right-hand side. Shown here is the optimized design using these parameters during an oscillatory cycle. Now we'll look at the electrical and mechanical characteristics that came out of the simulation of these vertical back end of line switches in operation. On the left, we see the color-coded voltage levels of the source, drain, and gate as the device moves through one oscillatory cycle. A fundamental operational property that distinguishes this three-terminal device from other NEM and MEM models is the change in source voltage as the beam makes contact with the drain. The increase in source voltage means that when contact between the drain and the source is made, the electrostatic force is reduced from both the decrease in the source drain voltage as the drain discharges through the source and they come to equilibrium, but it also is changed because of the decrease in source gate voltage as the uh, source beam's voltage moves up closer to the gate voltage. The additional decrease in gate source voltage means that the device can operate at a higher gate voltage since when during contact the source voltage rises closer to the gate voltage. On the right, we see the transient waveform with this operational principle and process. The, uh, the green in the waveform is the drain voltage and the uh, pink in the waveform or purple is the source voltage. And you can see during oscillation they're inverse of one another. So the gate voltage, however, cannot be increased indefinitely. Above a certain voltage threshold, the electrostatic force acting on the beam is great enough to warp the beam into contact with the gate. And this causes the device to get stuck to the gate, destroying it. This is called the catastrophic pull-in voltage, and it is shown on the left slide here, or um, the left diagram here. Uh, on the right, we actually see the range of drain voltages and gate voltages that both cause oscillation in the device and also lead to the uh, catastrophic pull-in voltage. So there's a window of gate drain voltage combinations that'll cause the device to oscillate, but outside of that, there's a dead zone, which for a number of different reasons, including uh, the, the, for a number of different reasons, um, the device doesn't operate in the dead zone because it stays stuck to the drain or it doesn't receive the proper pull-in voltage and it doesn't actually ever contact the drain. So the solution speed for an oscillatory icing system solving an optimization problem is directly proportional to the frequency that the system can oscillate at. So the left graph here shows colored curves, each of which, each of which represents a fixed drain voltage and the device's frequency response to varying the levels of gate bias. Now, the right graph represents the frequency response per drain voltage and is proportionally representative to the speed at which oscillatory networks uh, can uh, solve these optimization problems. And so what's really interesting here is we notice that the 
an increase in the uh, drain voltage uh, doesn't necessarily lead to an optimized frequency per voltage for the device. And so this device actually is operating most efficiently at around the two voltage on the drain mark. Um, but we can see that it oscillates the quickest when we get to a drain voltage of five. So real quickly, I'll talk about the next steps in this. Um, the next steps involve scaling it down to a five nanometer node, utilizing that other drain and gate voltage to see if we can increase the oscillatory speed. We could use a different uh, four terminal design back end of line. And the last thing that we need to do is obviously put a couple of these together, use some injection locking, get them to couple and see if they can solve these icing problems. In summary, today we've talked about uh, how oscillatory NEM switches have a low incremental, incremental process cost for added functionality, and that's that back end of line uh, manufacturing process. And in addition, they have a much more compact footprint. They've also been demonstrated to work up to 32 megahertz and have over a 10 megahertz per, per VD volt efficiency rate. Really quickly, I'd like to give an acknowledgement to um, my lab group and especially Professor Sujay King Liu, and then my personal mentor, uh, Lars P. Tatum. And then also a big shout out to the TTE program staff, Nicole, Sam, and Tony. It's been great and you guys have been incredibly helpful. The work was supported by the NSF REU site grant under award number 1757690. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thanks a lot, Isaac. Um, crazy enjoyed it. Um, hey, thank you, Dr. Butter. I'm a little bit familiar with this work <laughs> through E3S, of course. Uh -huh. um, and, and I remember one um, challenge with you know, NEM switches has been that if you make two, three, four, five, one of them, you know, even if you try to make them as identical as, as possible, you know, that the voltages are not exactly the same. So the, the, you know, the onset voltages. Mm -hmm. So if you want to use three, four, five of them in, you know, in a combined fashion, how do you take this into consideration, or or how, or can you, can you know, can you play around with with some other methods of of, of basically compensating for this? So that's a fantastic question. Now, my specific research project was more about getting a single device to oscillate, but our lab is currently working with those in-plane MEMS. Uh, devices and working to combine them in an oscillatory fashion. So that research is ongoing and we don't have results from that yet, but we have seen coupling between two of those MEMS switches. And so we're trying to optimize those parameters that you're talking about right now. And then we can apply it to these vertical back end of line switches when we get to that stage in research. Great. Awesome work. Enjoyed it a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I can't see the chat window, so if there are any questions, if someone could just uh, bump those to me, I, I would really appreciate that. Still waiting on some more questions. We've got a lot of comments on your slides, your energy. People feel smarter just looking. <laughs> I've already had someone ask me if you're available to uh, voice audiobooks, so we'll talk later about that. Fantastic. <laughs> any more questions for Isaac about his work? This is um, a little bit broad, but I guess I'm just kind of curious, um, like in a practical sense, uh, like what are the kind of social economic like implications of this research? Like, is this something that could be done at like a bigger scale and maybe change something in the industry? I mean, we hope so. Absolutely. That, that would be fantastic. Um, so, I mean, this research it can be used in a lot of different ways, but the main way that it could be used for is what I was talking about in the beginning, those combinatorial optimization problems. Those problems really are used in an incredibly wide range of applications. Um, and so by creating devices that can solve those problems at a much lower energy level and much quicker than uh, our current software and transistors can solve them at, we could potentially, one, create small isolated devices that can solve these problems on the spot without having to connect to a larger mainframe. We could also solve them faster when we do have a connection to a larger mainframe. Um, and those things can like speed up drug discovery. They can speed up uh, like optimization problems as far as like logistical problems go. Um, all different kinds of range of things. And then you could take it all the way out there to like internet of things applications um, and like really extending that concept. Uh, let me just add to this. Um, um, there's great precedence of wide range implications. So Professor uh, 
uh, King Lu, she is actually the co-inventor of the FinFET transistor, which is used basically in every computing device you're using today. Um, so there's clear precedence that you know research that goes on at Berkeley um, makes it into everyday devices, uh, you know, around the world. So. All right, very well done, Isaac. Congratulations. Right. Thank you very much. Our last presentation before we take a little bit of a break is from Kara Yi. Um, can everyone see yeah. my, or can you hear me at all? Sorry, um, my mic's been a little funny recently. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll get started. Um, hi, my name is Kara Yi. Um, I'm from Consumers River College, and I did research this summer with the Chakraborty Group through the Transfer to Excellence program. My research project this summer was focusing on um, monitoring microbial community diversity with cytometric fingerprinting. And through this project, we intended to really better understand the applications of flow cytometry and um, cytometric fingerprinting packages and algorithms like PhenoFlow for the purposes of monitoring microbial communities. But before I get into exactly what the motivations for our study were, I wanted to first introduce what flow cytometry or FCM is. So FCM is basically a process that allows us to separate out individual cells and um, analyze and collect data on their single cell phenotypic characteristics and staining properties. So to do this, cells that are inoculated into a buffer solution will be fed through a funnel system that you can see here. And the funnel will separate those cells into an individual stream of single cells. So those single cells will be targeted by a laser, which you can see here. And the laser will hit those cells and produce three different types of um, cell signals. So the three different types of cell signals will show different phenotypic properties of those cells. And um, those cell signals are uh, forward scatter, which shows the morphology or the size or shape of the cells. It side scatter, which shows the intracellular complexity or the granularity. And then there's the dye-specific fluorescent signals, which are, of course, um, specific to the type of fluorescent dye that you use. And the most common type that is used is nucleic acid dyes, which shows the nucleic acid content of the cells. So once those cell signals are, um, are produced, they're collected into the de detectors, which you can see here. And the detectors will send the data to a computer and those the data will then be compiled. Um, and through this FCM procedure um, and with FCM's rapid data collection on the cell's phenotypic characteristics, FCM really poses as a faster and very efficient method of monitoring microbial diversity when it's compared to the slower and more labor-intensive 16S rRNA amplicon sequencing. Specifically for our study, we focused on microbial communities produ in produced water bioreactors that treat produced water that's generated by the oil and gas industry. Because these produced water bioreactors really rely heavily on the microbial communities to perform essential biogeochemical treatment reactions, it's really essential for us to be able to understand um, and monitor these microbial communities to ensure that the, the diversity and the species present remain the same and can still continuously perform the treatment reactions over the course of the process. So to start our research, we first needed to collect data um, using the FCM. So to do so, we took isolates from a produced water membrane bioreactor and we inoculated those into marine broth. Once those isolates were grown, we made two different types of consortia and three different types of media, which you can see here. And um, one thing to note is that there's produced water one and produced water two, which have different TDS or salinity levels, which you can see here. And then we also have APM, which is our control. And that's um, a mineral broth that has 10% uh, marine broth added to it for greater nutrients. Um, and then once we made our consortia and inoculated them into their specific medias, we did consortia sampling to get 10 different generations. Then these generations were diluted appropriately, loaded into a 96 well plate, stained with 1x cyber green one, and then we loaded it into the FCM for data collection. With our data collected, we were able to start pre-processing the data to really improve visualization and to ensure that we remove any anomalies or noise within the data. 
So the specific parameters that we used were side scatter, forward scatter, and um, green and red fluorescence, or BL1 and BL3. And um, to really, uh, to be able to use this data, we first needed to import it and structure the data. So we used Flowcore, uh, our package, to do so. And then after importing the data, we transformed it using inverse hyperbolic sign, which allowed us to better visualize the cell signals instead of the machine noise. After we did that, we visualized the data using ggcyto and performed polygon gating, which allows us to select for specific cells within those gates, which you can kind of see here. And then um, our final step for pre-processing was using Flow AI, a denoising R package, to remove any background noise and caused by machines or the media and any other additional anomalous cells. So with that final step of pre-processing, we were able to start doing data analysis using PhenoFlow. And um, PhenoFlow is a cytometric fingerprinting package that really focuses on visualizing the phenotypic structure of a community and the subcommunities within it. And what this really meant for us was that we were able to visualize and analyze phenotypic diversity in a community, which uh, the phenotypic diversity is really based on the phenotypic characteristics that are present in the community, along with how the phenotypic characteristics are distributed throughout the community. So using the processes with PhenoFlow and our package, um, we were able to really perform the diversity analyses that we were looking to do, specifically focusing on the consortia phenotypic diversity with Hill's diversity index and similar phenotypic structures, similarities between uh, community phenotypic structures with NMDS. Um, but before I get into the diversity and the consortia themselves, I wanted to first take a look at the green versus red fluorescence, which we can see here. And um, with these plots, we have, um, sorry, we have red versus green. And then we also, each of those little tiny dots represents a specific cell signal associated with those characteristics. So um, a clustering of those cell signals will be represented as a specific cell, uh, a clustering of cells that have shared phenotypic properties. And upon looking at these graphs, you can see that there's a greater presence of clusters with the produced water consortia, which you can see here, uh, in comparison to the APM media, which you can see here. Um, and the greater number of clusters present in the produced water media likely suggests that produced water can support more species and thus has a greater diversity, while the fewer clusters present in APM as long as well as the uh, similarities between their visible structures, which you can see here, um, suggest that APM likely selects for specific species or doesn't support as many species as the produced water media does. Um, in addition to those uh, plots that you saw, we also wanted to look at the overall cell signals and cell counts over the course of generations. So we looked at the cell counts for each consortia in the media, and on our y-axis, we have the cell counts per milliliter, the cell density. And from these graphs, we can really see that after the first few transfers, the inocula, um, with after the inocula, there's a drop in cell count, but there's also a slow, continuous kind of increase as we continue through the generations. Another thing to note is that uh, both consortia seem to resemble each other in their growth patterns which you can see um, here. And then for the Hill phenotypic diversity, we used Hill in diversity index plots, which really allowed us to visualize and quantify the diversity for our consortia. And um, specifically, it helps us visualize the phenotypic diversity with each generation. So I just wanted to note for these graphs, the scaling on the y-axis is not the same. Um, just for visual comparison, I just wanted to let you guys know. But um, for these graphs, you can see there's a general decrease in diversity with APM, which you can see here. And this may be due to, again, a specific species or a group of species really dominating the consortia. And this is likely because APM selects for species a specific species that's more fast growing. And then with each generation or with each transfer, those species continue to propagate. And the only, only having a small amount of species decreases the overall diversity of the community. And then for produced water, for both of them, you can see a lack of stable diversity. And this may indicate, especially for produced water two, that produced water two and produced water one may be able to support a greater variety of species in its community. 
And uh, the community itself is continually evolving with each gen generation and each transfer. So to better visualize how our media really affects the phenotypic structure of our community, we made um, NMDS plots using PhenoFlow. And these plots really allowed us to see the similarities and dissimilarities between different generations and different medias for the same inoculum. So here you can see different points for each generation that is, and points and generations that are closer together are more similar and those that are farther apart are less similar. Um, I also thought it'd be important to note that we have our inocula plotted here, which is kind of in that weird coral color. Um, and also different shapes for these plots, NMDS plots will be associated with um, different medias for the specific consortia. So um, first to look at the APM, you can see strong similarities between each of the generations. And this is likely due to, for both consortia, sorry, um, this is likely due to the uh, presence of those strong dominant species in the media being continually propagated with each generation. And because of these species dominating, there's very little, um, uh, there is likely very little variation between the generations. So they are all very phenotypically similar in terms of their community structure. And then for the next one, we look at produced water one, which has a greater amount of dispersal, less clustering than you can see with the APM. Um, and this is likely due to uh, more presence or the presence of more species within the produced water samples. So um, you can see that with each transfer, there's greater diversity between each generation. So there's likely less phenotypic similarities between each of those generations. And um, these phenotypic characteristics of the community in that specific media become more variable. So, oh, sorry. Um, I also wanted to point out there's some similar structures here. Um, these clusters likely have very similar phenotypic structures. And then uh, for the final media with these two consortia, we wanted to look at the produced water two, which also shows a lot of dispersal across the plot with minimal clustering and a greater amount of dissimilarity between the generations. Like produced water one, it shows that there's a greater diversity in phenotypic structures of the community between generations and between uh, both consortia. So overall, we were able to observe that despite starting with the same inoculum, either seven isolate mix or 10 isolate mix, the phenotypic structure of the communities grown in different media occupied sort of distinct regions on the NMDS plots, which you can see with the regional clustering of these things. So to um, see how the um, consortias or the, the isolates in the consortia really affected the growth patterns that we saw and the phenotypic structures, um, we looked at NMDS plots with the media specifically and then comparing the inoculates that we have here and the consortias. So with the produced water media, specifically produced water one, you can see Oops, I'm sorry. Um, you can see two groupings individual of each other, and these two are the seven and the ten inoculates, or the, sorry, the seven and the ten consortia. So the um, distinguishing factor here is that they're clustered differently, and because of their difference in clustering, um, you can kind of it, it, it suggests that um, the addition of the three species present in the consortia ten really caused some um, phenotypic dissimilarities between the uh, two consortia for that specific media. For produced water two, it shows more regional gathering. Um, and this regional gathering of the generations for the consortia in this region right here shows that the addition of those three isolates didn't really have much of an effect on the growth, on their phenotypic structures. And for the APM, you can also see the same effect here where they're all sort of grouped together in the same corner over here. So there's more similarity between those phenotypic structures and the addition of those three isolates didn't really affect their growth. Um, so in conclusion, after examining and learning about a variety of different um, packages, we've selected, an we've selected an effective workflow using cytometric fingerprinting package PhenoFlow to really monitor um, phenotypic diversity and phenotypic similarities between each generation and each media. Based on our analysis, we've been able to conclude that community structure is strongly dependent on the media in which it's grown. 
APM specifically selects for the more faster growing media, while produced water has the capacity to support a greater amount of species or greater variety, sorry. Um, however, the community structure for both produced waters seems to be continually evolving with each transfer, so it doesn't really reach a, a stable or steady state within the 10 transfers performed in our study. For future studies and for future uh, research with our uh, concepts that we've discussed here, we aim to really examine 16S rRNA gene amplicon sequencing data to hopefully potentially validate the conclusions and the observations that we've seen here. Um, additionally, we may be able to use cytometric fingerprinting, but that's a whole different package. Um, thank, I'd like to thank um, my mentor, Dr. Shweta Akaria. I'd like to thank my PI, um, Professor Romy Chakraborty, and then the Chakraborty Lab Group. Um, I'd also like to thank the NSF for funding this research and everyone involved in the TTE program. Um, these are my references. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I know I went a little bit over. Um, does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, did you just use R for all of your graphics? Yeah, um, all of our graphics used R with the exception of our cell counts. So the cell counts were actually done in Excel. Oh, okay, got you. Also, um, could you explain what consortia means again, please? Yeah, sorry, I didn't clarify that. The consortias were basically a, the group of isolates that we used for the, the, the uh, medias. So uh, the seven and 10 was, the only difference was that there were three additional I isolates for the 10 consortias. Okay, thank you. Great job. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. What's mm -hmm. the difference between uh, the APM medium and produce water one and produce water two? Um, produce water one and produce water two are the, the produced water from the membrane reactors specifically, or sorry, the membrane bioreactors. So those were taken from, or those were produced water is from the, it's, it's a byproduct of the oil and gas industry. And then the APM media is a mineral-based media that has an addition of 10% marine broth, which basically adds nutrients. So that's why we used it as our control. Any other questions? Such a good job, there were no questions left. Kara, I'm wondering um, if you'd like to tell folks what you will be doing next year. Um, in the upcoming year and this fall, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I'm transferring to UC Davis. So I'll be a junior at UC Davis this upcoming year. What are you studying? Uh, microbiology. So <laughs> a little bit of a continuation from our project. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great job, Kara. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. With next up, we have Rocco. Rocco is the first of two interns who was hosted by um, Jeff Boker. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rocco, and I'm a computer engineering student from Santa Rosa Junior College in the Northern Bay Area. My presentation today will be on simulation and optimization of graphene nanoribbon transistors. And the goal of this research... Just a heads up, I don't know if it's just me, but we can only see half of your slide. Oh, shame. Yeah, it's the same for me. Looks good, there we go. How about now? Yep, looks good. Outstanding. All right, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so like I was saying, the goal of our research was to use mathematical models to guide how these next generation devices will be made. But before I go into specifics on graphene nanoribbon transistors, let's take a look at a challenge of modern computing. At the heart of every computer is the transistor. 
It is at its most basic level an on-off switch, and when a handful of them are combined, they can perform mathematical operations. Here on the left, we see a chip designed by IBM, and that is about the size of your thumbnail. And on that single chip are 50 billion transistors. And if we zoom in closer with a scanning electron microscope, we can see six of them here. And chips like this are around us every day in our phones, our computers, of course, even refrigerators, and they keep getting smaller. Now, transistors and computer chips have been miniaturized to micro and now nano level since the 1960s, but today we are encountering limitations as the size of these transistors goes below 20 nanometers. And this challenge is centered around quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is an amazing phenomenon of quantum physics, where an electron on a path may just tunnel through an object and continue on its way at a lower speed. Let's see a demonstration. Here we have an electron flying through space and before it is an obstacle. Depending on the thickness and other attributes of that obstacle, there is a probability that an electron may tunnel directly through it. And with this quantum tunneling, there's a positive side and a negative side. Let's first take a look at the negative. Here we have a modern FinFET transistor. On this side, we have the source where the electrons are stored. And when we apply a voltage to this gate region, the electrons travel from the source into the central channel, out of the drain, and the device is in an on state. If we were to take away that voltage to the gate region, the electrons stay in the source, they do not go in the channel, they do not go through the drain, and the device is in an off state. And now this negative side to quantum tunneling appears as this entire transistor gets smaller and smaller to the point that this channel region becomes so small that after a while, there is a high probability that an electron in the source will tunnel directly through the channel and into the drain when the device is in an off state. And this source to drain tunneling is the main challenge that engineers face as these transistors continue to scale down. And to meet this challenge, we propose that we can take out this central silicon region and replace it with a graphene nanoribbon. But what are these ribbons? On the left, we have a molecular structure of graphene nanoribbon. They are comprised of carbon atoms. And in this case, they are seven, seven atoms wide and one atom thick. And these are an ideal channel material because they promote high carrier mobility and have high current carrying capacity. So a lot of electrons, many charges, and a lot of current can travel through them in a device. And here we see them zoomed in with a scanning tunneling microscope. And these ribbons take on this honeycomb lattice. And after a very complicated fabrication process to create these ribbons with smooth edges and at ideal lengths, how are they incorporated into devices? So here in this transistor, we have replaced this central silicon region with a graphene nanoribbon. And now we have a graphene nanoribbon transistor. Again, we have a source region where the electrons are stored. And when we apply a voltage to this gate, the electrons go from the source into the channel out of the drain when the device is in an off state. And before I spoke about the source to drain tunneling that is occurring in classic transistors as they scale down, which is the bad effect of quantum tunneling, here that probability is very low because graphene nano ribbons have a large energy gap and high effective mass. I would now like to explore a positive side of quantum tunneling and how it can be harnessed to make this device better than classic transistors. But first, another challenge. Previous research has encountered many challenges at the source to channel and drain to channel contact areas, which are enlarged here. And our research sought to shed light on these areas and to understand how we can encourage quantum tunneling so that electrons could travel across these very small gaps in this region right here and here. So to understand more about these contact areas, let's take a look at an energy diagram. In this diagram, we see that there are two spikes, one occurring at the source to channel and the other occurring at the drain to channel contact areas. And these spikes are called Schottky barriers. And we'll focus on the one on the left. And the y-axis here, we have the amount of energy that is applied to the gate and therefore goes into the channel. And by applying voltage, we excite electrons to travel into the channel. They can do so by either thermionic field emission which is quantum tunneling through the Schottky barrier or through thermionic emission by going over the Schottky barrier and into the channel. Now, 
here's where we would like to really capitalize on the quantum tunneling because an electron at a lower energy level, we would like it to tunnel through because that is more energy efficient as opposed to exciting an electron with a lot of energy so that it thermionically emits into the channel region. So to understand more about what's happening at these barriers, let's take a look at the dimensions. So here we see phi b, which is the Schottky barrier's height, and we also see lambda, which is the Schottky barrier's width. And these dimensions have a great effect on how likely the electron is to travel from the source region and into the channel. Like I said before, ideally, we would like to apply a small amount of voltage to the gate, so that way an electron can tunnel through this barrier and into the channel when it is in an on state. And so to simulate what is happening in this graph, we look to equations made by scientists that came before us. In our simulation, we use the landauer brucker formalism, and this integral is capturing the number of charges, the number of electrons going through the channel, which is going to be our metric for how the device is performing uh, throughout our results. And this amount of charge and current going through the device is dependent on how much voltage we apply to the gate and therefore to the channel. And this integral is dependent on the Fermi Dirac distributions, which determine the number of energy states that are occurring in the source to channel and the drain to channel contact areas. And this integral is also dependent on the probability of tunneling at those barriers. The Schottky barrier tunneling is also dependent on this WKB approximation, which was determined by the Schottky barrier's height and other dimensions. And so with these formulas, as well as others, we were able to find these following results. Our first results were how lambda and phi b affected ion. Ion on the y-axis here for both of these plots is, is our metric for success, which is the amount of current going through the device when it is in an on state. And as we can see here that when lambda is low and it has a small thickness, we're getting a lot of current through the device, which is ideal. And as we increase that thickness of that Schottky barrier width, we are decreasing the overall current going through the device because we're no longer promoting a high probability of quantum tunneling. We also see on this plot, power on the y-axis and the barrier height on the x-axis. We know that as the barrier height increased, the output energy decreased, and that if the lambda was thicker, in this case, this blue line, that the effect was much more severe by orders of magnitude. And from these graphs, we conclude that a thinner lambda on a vice was much more beneficial. And we then used the simulation further to help tune this lambda value. Factors that affect lambda are in this gate dielectric, this blue region here. In this case, we're using silicon dioxide. And the two attributes of this gate dielectric are its thickness in the vertical direction, as well as its permittivity, which is the ability for this material to hold a number of charges to then produce an electric field. So first looking at the gate dielectric's thickness, we see that as we increased the thickness of the gate dielectric, we are increasing lambda which is not ideal because we're no longer promoting a high probability of tunneling. Conversely, if we were to increase the permittivity of our device, we see that the lambda is reduced, and this is ideal. And from these graphs, we see that we were able to use the simulation to help tune our lambda values, and now we were able to simulate various devices. Here we see the results of our analysis that are two energy diagrams. On the left, we're using silicon dioxide at 50 nanometers thick, and we're also using a permittivity K value of 3.9. And as we can see here, we have a very thick lambda, which would require a lot of energy for the electron to go into this channel because it would have to likely occur at a higher energy level, which is not ideal. We then modify the parameters to where we have hafium oxide at 6.5 nanometers thick with a permittivity level of 16.9. And now our lambda is much smaller, creating a more a higher performance device with higher on current at lower energy levels. And so we were able to, what would have taken maybe a few weeks to fabricate and test these devices, the simulation was able to calculate in a few hours. In conclusion, we find that smaller lambda values are beneficial for device performance. And we also see that simulation can optimize many features of device, not just lambda, such as channel length and transfer length. 
we also see that the cost of simulation is far lower than the cost of fabrication. And this really allows scientists to explore new ideas that may be cost prohibitive or just very unorthodox. I'd like to make a few acknowledgements first to my mentor, Cosmo Lin, who taught me so much about electricity and the physics behind modern transistors, and you gave me guidance so that one day I hope to be a mentor and help another young scientist in the same way you helped me. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our principal investigator, Jeffrey Boker. You showed me how to be an effective leader and facilitator of a research group and how to foster an atmosphere of learning and helping one another to solve research challenges. Thank you. I'd also like to Thank my family, Nick and Crystal, as well as my girlfriend, Rachel, who helped me through this program, make sure I took care of myself during this challenging internship. I'd also like to thank my SRJC professors and my amazing director, Darcy Rosales. You gave me the tools to succeed and prepared me to thrive inside and outside of the classroom. Also a big thank you to everyone in TTE, my entire cohort, your advice and shared stories encouraged me to stay on this path and try my best. And I hope to see you all at Cal in the future. And lastly, thank you to E3S, as well as the National Science Foundation for their commitment to student success. Thank you. And this concludes my presentation. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and just thank you all so much for your time. Hey, Rocco, um, great presentation. Fantastic, I love the material. Um, when uh, I might have missed it in the slide presentation, but did you go over if there's any like leakage current in the off state for this particular device? That is a, a critical thing that we're, we're really trying to um, minimize is leakage current. And um, by modifying like the gate dielectric um, to just keeping it like as thin as possible, we want to be able to um, have the most control over what's happening uh, in the channel. Um, but the uh, leakage current um, is still a, a current challenge uh, with graphene nanoribbon uh, transistors as well as you know, classical transistors. Awesome. Thank you. I, uh, I had a quick question. You mentioned towards the end of your presentation that this research uh, could help make it so that future research is able to use simulations uh, and get results a little bit quicker than they would if they were actually fabricating these materials themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just kind of curious if you had any more specific examples that you could think of of like, you know, future research that could be based off of this and use those sorts of simulations. Great question. So for the future um, with simulation, um, it, I think it'd be a great idea to hand this off to an artificial intelligence to where we can then train an AI network to find um, advantageous and beneficial device attributes um, to where um, there are so many different attributes to these devices that can be uh, tuned and fitted and optimized. And so I think that a next um, step for research would definitely be to let loose uh, an artificial intelligence on these kinds of simulations to guide the design. Awesome, thank you. Hi, Rocco. Uh, that's, that's really interesting, great, great presentation. Uh, I have a question about the hafnium dioxide. Um, so would the idea be that the, the nano ribbons are formed on the dielectric or is it more like a transfer process? It is a very challenging process in order to um, get graphene nanoribbons um, placed and ideally it would be in situ to where we're definitely um, putting uh, graphene nanoribbons with their clean edges and uh, good dimension onto um, the medium, um, the substrate. But uh, at this point, uh, there is a challenge to where we're really leaning on the transfer process, either through a uh, wet transfer or through bubble transfer. And it would be ideal to, like I said, place it in situ to avoid um, those transfer processes because um, those create other challenges such as contamination. Is there now exposure to the atmosphere? Uh, are we getting um, different elements um, inside and underneath of the graphene nanoribbon? So hopefully in the future, uh, there will be processes to where we can place these graphene nanoribbons uh, in their good dimension directly onto the material. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Rocco, there's a question in the chat from Alejandra. Uh, she oh, asked, what kind of device would you want to test or implement this technology in? And what devices? I would like to see these um, in the future uh, replace the 
just transistors for, for everything. We had uh, classical transistors that were then uh, replaced by FinFET transistors um, due to all of their um, awesome attributes. And then if we were to have graphene nanoribbon transistors, this could reduce power consumption um, across computers globally. And the current um, power consumption uh, used in data centers is around um, 50%, which is just for cooling. And so much power is used just to keep data centers cold. And if we were to implement uh, graphene nanoribbon transistors globally, uh, this would save so much power and therefore um, reduce impact in the climate and um, hopefully lead us um, to a better age of, of electrical efficiency. Hey, Rocco, thanks for the uh, very interesting talk. I, uh, I really liked uh, your figures, actually. Uh, they, they were very clean, very well put together. Um, uh, so one big picture question. So um, on one hand, you know, you mentioned, you know, the justification is, you know, the, the gate lengths are getting smaller. Uh, so tunneling is becoming more of an issue, uh, right? Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, um, you, you've also pointed out that these new graphing nanoribbon like processes are getting like more and more complex, um, right? So what do you think will come first? Do you think we will hit like some tunneling limit or do you think there'll be like some economic, you know, just like fabrication challenge uh, limit, uh, you know, looking into like far into the future? I think that right now, um... We're looking at both of those things occurring. Um, there's challenges even with source to drain tunneling um, with carbon nanotubes. Um, in some of the literature is saying that as those scale below 10 nanometers, they're encountering tunneling issues. And um, it's currently a, a need for the scientific community um, posted in, in, in a, a review article this year saying that we need more simulation um, programs like this to really quantify exactly what's happening in those um, sub 15, sub 10 nanometer uh, regimes uh, for size. So um, there could potentially be another fundamental limit, um, but hopefully we can keep Moore's law at, at bay uh, for a short, for, for a time. <laughs> um, the other question about uh, how do we scale this to where um, it's, it's an industry? And um, that has many challenges because of um, just the fabrication process of, of transferring, um, even just synthesizing these graphene nanoribbons um, has huge challenges. So um, there will need to be a definite uh, research advancement in how these uh, can be uh, produced uh, consistently. Because when we're looking at, you know, 50 billion transistors in, on the size of a thumbnail, we want to make sure they all work. Um, and so in order to get that kind of consistency um, for enterprise level um, and consumer level uh, products, uh, it'll still take uh, some more time. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm curious, after working with these over the summer, like, what is your personal opinion? Like, which do you think will be, like, a bigger challenge? Like, the, the physical limit or the, like, you know, retooling and, you know, getting the fabrication down? I believe fabrication at, at, at its current level right now is is the uh, largest obstacle um, to making sure that um, the graphene nanoribbons, because in these diagrams, they look like it's just one um, strip, but really it, it's a bunch of them uh, in a line. And um, we want to make sure they're all facing the right direction. They're not overlapping. They're not bundling up. These are very fragile structures that are only one atom thick. So I think that fabrication is uh, the largest hurdle that we're going to be facing in the next few years. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Well done, Rocco. Congratulations. Thank you. I think if you ever decide not to be a researcher, you could also have a backup career as an NPR host. <laughs> With that, we are going to move on to another really great intern from Professor Boker's lab, Darren Munoz. You ready, Darren? Yeah. Please let me know if I cut out or if you can't see my slideshow. Let me get this out of the way. All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Darren Munoz, and I'm a computer science student at Allen Hancock College. And as you know, this summer I did research in the TTE program at UC Berkeley uh, under my mentor, Dr. Zafir Mutlu, and my PI, Professor Jeffrey Boker. 
And like the last participant, I'm going to be talking about graphene nano ribbon transistors as well, but specifically, I'll be talking about the influence of channel length on graphene nano ribbon transistor performance. So first, I'll introduce you to what graphene nano ribbons are. Then I'll take you through the motivation for this study. Next, I'll show you how graphene nano ribbons are synthesized and how transistor devices are fabricated from them. Then I'll take you through the metrics that we considered in this study and the results thereof. And last, I'll conclude with a summary and a discussion for some future considerations. But first, what are graphene nanoribbons? Well, graphene nanoribbons are nanoscale strips or cutouts of graphene. And graphene is a single atom thick sheet of carbon atoms that are hexagonally bonded together, as you can see in this image here on the left. I'll grab my laser pointer. And the important thing about graphene nanoribbons is that they have a band gap, whereas graphene does not. And two very important aspects of graphene nanoribbons that uh, contribute to this band gap are one, the width, which is the number of carbon atoms counted along this direction here. So you can see they're being counted uh, one through nine. And the other aspect is, are the edge structure. This is an armchair edge structured graph, graphene nano ribbon, and um, it is considered along this direction here. And if you were to look at this direction, you would see that this is a zigzag uh, armchair graphene, sorry, uh, graphene nano ribbon. But as you can see uh, on this image on the right, one important aspect of graphene nano ribbons is that the band gap is inversely proportional to the number of carbon atoms. And so the tunable band gap of graphene nano ribbons and the theoretical promise of higher current density, uh, lower subthreshold swing, high on state current, and high on to off current ratios, as well as excellent charge carrier mobilities, make graphene nano ribbons an excellent candidate for future high performance transistor devices. And for those of you who don't know, uh, this is a picture of a transistor here. It's a field effect transistor. It's a three terminal device. We have a source and a drain between which the channel sits, uh, which carries the current, and the gate metal modulates that current. And so our graphene nanoribbons will sit right here in the channel as our semiconductor material. And the distance between the source and drain, uh, this distance here, is the channel length. All right, so now I'll take you through the motivation of this study. Despite all of the promise of graphene nanoribbons, the reality is that the transistors that are being fabricated from them are not performing the way we expect them to. So the main goal of this study is to better understand graphene nanoribbons and to use uh, that understanding to move them closer to their theoretical potential. And this study specifically sought to do that by looking at how transistor channel length affects graphene nanoribbon transistor device performance. So now I'll show you how graphene nanoribbons are synthesized and how transistor devices are fabricated from them. So the graphene nanoribbons that were used in this study are nine atom wide armchair edge structured graphene nanoribbons. And they're grown through sublimating monomer precursors pictured here on the left onto a gold substrate. And this is done through several annealing steps wherein the functional groups pictured here, say uh, iodine, leave and the monomers undergo carbon to carbon coupling as shown here. And then uh, through another annealing step, they would lose their hydrogen atoms and will graphitize into graphene nanoribbons. And the result that you see uh, is captured in this scanning tunneling microscopy image here on the right. And you can see that the GNRs are highly dense and locally aligned. So after GNRs are grown on gold, we place it into a hydrochloric solution and the growth substrate is cleaved from the GNRs in gold, which floats up to the surface where we can grab, take a device substrate and grab the GNRs and then place it into a gold etchant solution, which gets rid of the gold. So this is a wet transfer method. And afterward, we pattern the source and drain contacts onto the devices. For this study, uh, backgated devices were utilized which is pictured here in this greenish color, this tungsten metal. And a five and a half nanometer hafnium oxide dielectric was used. And here are our GNR sitting in the channel. And this is a side view of our transistor device. 
And so in this image on the left, this is a top-down view of six different transistor devices, which are labeled here, D1 through D6. The dark objects are the source and drain contacts, while the distance between them uh, is the channel length where our GNRs will sit. I used ImageJ software to measure these transistor channel lengths across four of these different images, and the results are shown here on the right. And for this study, device sets uh, D1 through D4 were used because of their distinct channel length ranges. And this allows for the clear assessment of uh, channel length's impact on device performance. And about 250 devices were separated into these uh, four channel length range sets. So now I'll take you through the metrics that we considered and the results of this study. So what you're looking at here is an IV transfer characteristic. It's the drain current plotted against the gate voltage. And devices were selected based on having gate leakage current that was at least 10 times lower than the drain current. And our first metric is on current. It's the maximum drain current. And it's important to maximize on current in order to maximize circuit speed. The second metric is off current. This is the minimum drain current. And it's important to minimize uh, off current because uh, static power dissipation is proportional to off current. And the third metric is on off current ratio shown here. It's simply the on current divided by the off current. And it's a very important metric for considering the viability of the material uh, for logic devices. And last we have subthreshold swing, otherwise known as subthreshold slope. And this parameter characterizes the amount of voltage required to turn the devices on from the subthreshold uh, regime. For the next five or six uh, plots, we're gonna be looking at the results here. They are in the form of cumulative distribution function plots, where we have a distribution of data points according to the parameter on the x-axis. So in this first case, uh, on current and microamps. And the different plot lines are going to represent different channel length ranges that the devices fall into. And so for on current, uh, we see that for the short channel devices, they have the highest on current, whereas the longest channel devices have the lowest on current. And there are two uh, potential explanations for this. The first is that as we increase the channel length, which is shown in this top down, scheme here, uh, less and less GNRs will bridge the source to drain gap. And it's important to note that uh, working devices consist of at least one GNR bridging the source to drain gap. So as we increase it, we expect less of them to bridge the gap and to therefore lower the current. Um, and as we decrease this, this channel length range, what we'll see is more overlap between the contact, like the source contact and the GNR. And so this will allow more charge carriers to be uh, injected from the source contact into the GNRs and will increase the current. And for the on-off current ratio, the trend is very similar in terms of which devices perform the best, except for this time, we see that the short channel devices have the worst on-off current ratio. It's about, a, about an order of magnitude lower than the middle channel length sets. And from a calculation perspective, you can see that this is because the short channel devices have high off current. So uh, it's thought that this is because of short channel effects like source to drain tunneling, as uh, Rocco had mentioned, and drain induced barrier lowering. And for the long channel devices uh, with lower on off current than uh, as is expected, this can be explained by uh, Charge carriers relying more on GNR to GNR screening effects. So leaving the source contact and sort of jumping between GNRs that are connected to bridge this source to drain gap rather than traveling through say a single GNR. And this will lower their speed and therefore lower the on current. And now we have subthreshold swing. So in general, our subthreshold swing is very high. We would like it to be uh, much lower. This could be explained by bundling, which is a more uh, extreme version of network effects or GNR to GNR screening. 
And basically the GNRs will sort of start to overlap and mangle with each other. And uh, when that happens, we have less control over the channel uh, with our with our gate, our bottom gated devices. And um, this will lower the sub or sorry, keep the subdural swing high, but we don't know to what extent. And as far as the short channel devices, which had the highest subdural swing at around a volt per decade, um, this can be explained by the short channel effects that were mentioned earlier. And I ran a quick analysis on our double gated devices. So we just added a, a top gate, a dielectric and top gate to the to the top to the channel. And what we see is less variation in subdural swing by channel, as shown here in the plot on the right. And also you see that the subdural swing has been halved in, in general. So this is great because it shows better electrostatic control over the channel that we have slightly improved device switching performance and perhaps reduce some of the short channel effects that were mentioned. So now I'll summarize and discuss some future considerations. So this study showed a strong correlation between the channel length and various aspects of device performance and that short channel devices are dominated by short channel effects. We also demonstrated a better electrostatic control for the double gated devices. And in the future, uh, researchers should look to improve the, continue to increase the length of GNRs in order to uh, increase the number of GNRs that are bridging that source to drain gap and to increase the contact length or the contact overlap in order to increase the on current. And also special consideration should be give, given to the placement of GNRs in order to make sure that they're aligned and have um, similar pitch or spacing between them in order to prevent the long channel devices from relying on GNR to GNR screening effects. And last, uh, cleaner methods for synthesis should be explored in order to reduce defects and uh, things like bundling. And I want to thank everyone who uh, was involved in this research and who provided support and made this happen. And thank you to all of you for listening. I'll open it up for questions now. Hey, yeah. Aaron. Um, oh, oh go, ahead, go right ahead, Isaac. No, you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Um, hey, Aaron, that was a fantastic. Uh, uh, presentation and I really enjoyed that you and Rocco had back to back because it really drove home like what your lab is doing. I thought that was really cool. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering when you start talking about uh, like the transfer capabilities and the manufacturing capabilities of these carbon nano um, are are there any like processes that are being explored that would create like a more uniform distribution of the ribbons and so would be able to um, like offset some of the short channel effects that you know about? Is that like being pursued right now? I believe that it has been pursued. I would actually like to hand this one over to my mentor if he's here, uh, Zafir Mutlu. See what he has to say about this one. I don't know that he's here, Darren, unfortunately. Yes, I am here. Uh, this is Zafir. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I think uh, for that question, uh, we, you know, for uh, we are using spatial substrates that allows to, you know, uh, align the GNRs. Yes, so it is possible to obtain aligned graphene and ribbons. Hope I answer your question. It requires a little bit a spatial substrate. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. My question is, a, I guess, a little bit low level, but um, could you just kind of clarify the difference between wet and dry transfer when you're synthesizing these materials? Yeah, the, the wet transfer is very dirty. Like we, we use chemicals to etch away the, the substrate and um, a dry transfer method would explore ways to transfer the GNRs without having to use um, aqueous solution to etch away the substrate. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you.
Okay, very, very good job, Darren. Congratulations. Thank you. With that, we are going to move on to Adam. Adam, are you ready? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, so I guess I'll just get started here. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Abraham. I'm a student at Los Angeles Pierce College. And today I'll be discussing my research, uh, which has to do with computational image processing for point of use soil health assay. Okay, so just kind of getting right into it. Um, well, actually before I get into it, I just wanna give a brief overview on soil health, um, just because this is very important to understanding my research. Okay, so what is uh, soil health? Um, so soil health can be characterized as having a balanced ecosystem, having high biodiversity, and functionality. So when discussing a balanced ecosystem, that just means having a lot of different types of animals, plants, and microorganisms uh, depending on one another in a sustainable environment. Um, when we talk about high biodiversity, um, we can kind of just see that in this photo here. That just means and talks about having a lot of types of diverse communities of fungi, bacteria, microorganisms, and insects that allow for nutrients in the soil. When we talk about functionality, uh, what does functionality mean? Functionality means how functional is the soil? What can the soil do? Uh, so some examples of that is how much water can the soil hold or how much, how much nutrients can the soil hold? Um, okay, next slide. So how is soil health measured? Um, so soil health, uh, can be measured through three different types of indicators. We have physical indicators, we have chemical indicators, and we have biological indicators. So a physical indicator basically is just anything that you can see physically in the soil. So an example of that can be seen in this photo here. This is an example of compaction. It's actually a negative thing. Um, it happens due to unsustainable uh, practices or a lot of toiling. And what happens is over time, the soil will become compacted and it'll make it very difficult for crops to uptake water and nutrients. Okay, so now we go into chemical indicators. So chemical indicators basically have anything to do with uh, the chemicals in the soil or chemical reactions. And one of the most popular indicators can be seen here in this photo, which is a pH soil tester. Um, now we go into biological indicators. This is kind of more uh, where my research is more focused on and specifically, we care mostly about something called microbial respiration. So what is microbial respiration? So um, you have these little tiny organisms in the soil called microorganisms. And what they do is they break down uh, soil matter and they give off something called CO2. Um, just as you and I, I kind of will I'll go to the next slide here. Just as you and I breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, uh, these, microorganisms naturally uh, give off or respire CO2. And you can kind of see it here in this diagram. You kind of see these little tiny microorganisms, they break down uh, soil matter uh, and they pretty much produce or help produce these elements here. And this is necessary or important because it helps crops grow successfully and it helps increase uh, crop yields. And you can kind of see here that they respire or give off CO2. Okay. Now we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty. Um, why does any of this matter? Why is this important? So as population rates are increasing in the world, so is the need for uh, to produce more food and uh, crops to produce biofuels and things like that. Um, okay, so in other words, if I'm a farmer or I'm an agriculturalist and I have this kind of plot of land here, how can I use this land, this existing land that I have, and these existing crops to produce more or to produce, uh, to increase the yield of this crop. So researchers believe that we can simply do this just by monitoring uh, soil health um, and specifically by using microbial respiration. The problem with using microbial respiration is that um, it uses a lot of expensive analytical equipment. So it's not necessarily available to the common person. So our research basically focuses on trying to use that technology and give that technology into the hands of the common person. How do we propose to do this? 
So our research proposes to do this by providing a kit, which you can kind of see here. And the kit will provide this thing here. This is called a well plate. Uh, and each kind of little well here has a small test tube, which I'm hoping that you can see here. It'll look, this is just an example of the test tube. Um, there will be 96 wells. And an example of how this will happen, I'm just gonna use this test tube as an example. A farmer or agriculturalist will take a small soil sample, about 48 micrograms. They will put that into this test tube here. They will add about 30 microliters of this liquid. This liquid is called microbial growth medium. They'll add this into the test tube. And what this does is it activates the microorganisms in the test tube. Um, there will be a, sorry about that. There will be a small cap here. You can't really see it in this image. You can kind of see it more in this image. But there will be a small cap here that is a color changing pH, uh, cresol red in solid state uh, agar which is this liquid here. What we do is we take this cap, we close it, and we wait two hours. Now, remember, during these two hours, there are microorganisms in this test tube. Microorganisms naturally produce or give off CO2 through microbial respiration. After the two hours, depending on the amount of CO2 that's produced in this test tube, will actually change the color of the cap. And we kind of have that here. We have a lot of different types of colors and pHs here. And the colors can actually tell us how healthy the soil is, which is an amazing thing. Um, this kit will also come with a downloadable app that you can download on your smartphone. And the reason that we have the app is, um, for instance, let's say a farmer, okay, he has his soil sample here. He basically, what he will do is he'll upload this photo into the application and through image processing, we will be able to determine based on the pHs and the colors um, how healthy the soil is. And what we want to do is also give information uh, and kind of give, uh, I guess you could say, advice on how to amend the soil, uh, what nutrients to add to the soil, and things like that. So now um, my research specifically had to do with uh, building the image processing part of the application. So I'll just get kind of right into that. Okay. So we have a sample here. This is our sample. This is a picture of the well plate. But what we want to do is we only care about the well plate itself. We don't want anything on the outside. Um, we just care about focusing on this object within the image. Um, so there's many ways to do this. Uh, the way that I did it was through a computer programming language called Python using many different libraries. I used a blur function to blur the photo and expose the contours of the plate. Um, once that happened, I used a rectangle function, which was then able to detect the first edge of the plate and tag it. And as you can kind of see here in this image, we have detected our object of interest. I then use, uh, used a crop function to then crop the image. And now we have our plate. And the reason that we crop the image and we just want to focus on the plate itself is just in case a farmer or agriculturalist takes a picture, we don't want any of the, the background information. We just want to focus on the uh, plate itself. Okay, next uh, is resizing. Though we have this amazingly large and beautiful picture here, it's way too big. And uh, it's not efficient for uh, image processing and will take way too long. Uh, so what I decided to do is I used a resizing function and I changed the size from this large size here to a smaller size here of 600 by 400. And this was done for efficiency. Okay, so now we've already uh, cropped our image. We've now resized our image and we have this uh, 600 by 400 image. Uh, now what we wanna do is we just wanna focus on this, these colors and this information here. Now I just wanna say, that each row here uh, actually shows us the pH. So for instance, this is pH four, this is pH six, pH seven, pH eight, and so on and so forth. Um, every image contains a small pixel. So every image is made up of tiny little pixels. And what we wanna do is we wanna be able to find the range of these colors and separate that from the rest of the pixels. So how I did that is I used a function to uh, basically expose the data within each pixel. And, how, and an example of that is here. So now we have data that we can now read and plot. Uh, so every image, again, that we see 
uh, every pixel has readable data. And I just kind of showed that here. There are probably hundreds or thousands of more lines of this. I just showed this as, as an example. Okay, so what does this data exactly mean? Um, if we kind of just take a piece of data here, um, we have three points here. Each point uh, signifies a different type of color. So the first is red, the second is green, the third is blue. And uh, depending on the number of either red, green, or blue, combined produces a color. When you have thousands of these little pixels uh, basically creating different colors, we now have an image that we see. I notice that if we have three points here, one, two, three, we have a basic common coordinate system, which is X, Y, and Z. And um, the next thing I did was I just used a function to plot this data on a 3D scatter plot. And that's what we can see here. And I really wanna outline this because this to me was uh, incredible and beautiful. This is our image. If we kind of go back here, we have the yellows, we have the reds and we have the grays. We can see all of that here on this 3D scatter plot. We have our yellows, we have our reds, and we have the grays from the plate itself. So the next thing to do is to separate the colors. And what I did is, it might be kind of hard to see, but I chose a point here, which is the lightest yellow. I also chose a point here, which is the darkest yellow. By choosing these two points, I was able to make a range or a mask, and any data point that would fall, or any pixel that would fall in between this range would be picked up. And that's what we see here. We now have our yellow processed. I did the same thing with the red. I took about a range over here, the lightest red, the darkest red, made a range or a mask, and we're able to see that here. I just put both ranges together, both masks together, and we now have our image. We now have our image processed. Um, the last thing that we did is that we graphed this uh, on standard curves. Um, the reason that we did this is we wanted to find a more accurate uh, coloring. So we kind of uh, made this into different channels. We got a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. And out of all of these channels, uh, the most accurate, as actually you can kind of see here, the most linear, the most accurate is the red channel. And that makes sense uh, because we're dealing mostly with reds and yellows. Um, for future work, what we want to do is we want to use this to run more plates just to make this more accurate. Uh, the standard curve is used uh, to kind of build a standard color. Uh, we want to run more plates, and we kind of have a question here. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, this is pH 4, and this is kind of pH 5, but we don't have anything in the middle. We don't have a pH, uh, sorry, pH 6. We don't have anything here in the middle, which is pH 5, which would be kind of an orange color in between. Uh, to be able to find that pH, we would have to run more tests, be able to expose those colors, use the standard curve, and um, yeah, perform that data. Um, that's my presentation. I'd like to make some acknowledgments to my mentor, Dr. Sarah Gushkari Doyle, my principal investigator, Dr. Rami Chakraborty, the entire TTEUC Berkeley team, Nicole, Tony, Sam, everyone in the cohort. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to the National Science Foundation for funding this and uh, my family and my community. Um, they've been a great support and I love them. So does anyone have any questions? These are my resources. Yeah, Adam, I have a quick question. Um, first off, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, could you go back to the slide about the, uh, the kit and the procedure and all that? You talking about this one? Um, I think it's still loading. It was the one with the image of the test. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see it now. Um, I was kind of curious on this whole procedure. Um, I know these samples are taking place outside. Uh, and, you know, farmers don't have AC out in the farms. Uh, so is this uh, procedure affected by any way by the change in temperature? Okay, so were those two questions or was that one question? I'm just well, trying just, to understand. Yeah, just one. Um, okay, there was something, uh, this is actually a kit that a farmer will be able to use. So he or she will be able to go out into the field, take a soil sample and, uh, and do this on their own. Uh, the reason that we did this, um, the reason we actually built the application in the first place was that we didn't want to just limit this to lab work. We wanted to have this technology in the hands of uh, farmers. So instead of using a spectrophotometer to read this, uh, this image with the different colors, we have an application. 
that does this uh, for them. So this, this will be for the use uh, in field for farmers and agriculturalists. I think that, that I just wanted to clarify on that point. Um, the second thing you said is, will this be affected by temperature? So um, that's a great question. Naturally, uh, microorganisms, uh, we have abiotic and biotic factors and temperature is a factor that does affect microorganisms, um, definitely with high temperatures, low temperatures and things like that. Um, but for the most part, um, the communities will be stable. And, and again, this it's an ideal setting, of course, but with like high amounts of heat or droughts, it can affect the uh, microorganisms in the communities in the soil. Um, but for the most part, uh, we're hoping that they, those communities kind of stay strong and are dependable. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Thank you so Sorry much. for the noise in the background. <laughs> I had um, a little question on the like image processing side of things. Uh, okay. I was just kind of curious when it comes to reducing things down to like red pixels, for example, if the farmer taking this picture was like wearing a red shirt and a little bit of that were to reflect off of the kind of clear plastic casing that these samples are put in, uh, okay. would that like affect the measurement or anything like that? I'm just kind of curious if there's a way to kind of denoise uh, these measurements, if that makes sense. Okay, that's a good question. So um, basically that's why we kind of have the cropping function here is that in case there's like a boot or in case there's a piece of a shirt or something like that in the background, we want to crop the image so that we just focus on the plate itself. Um, but uh, there are things such as glare or other things like that, uh, which with each, with each image, and you can kind of see that when we process the image itself, you can kind of see these black spots. Um, and that has to do with glare or that has to do with uh, shadows and things like that. So that definitely will affect uh, the image minimally or the color that we extract minimally. But the good thing is that by using a standard curve, we take an average. So um, here we took an average of the first row. So even though we have kind of this black spot here by taking the averages, uh, hopefully that'll balance that out. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Adam, I have a question. Sure. Um, great job on the presentation. But when you uh, cropped your image and you resized it to a smaller uh, uh, pixel, uh, mm -hmm. 600 by 400, how did you preserve the image quality? And was there anything done to keep like the, the image quality uh, similar or the same? Okay, so you're saying like whether or not the image stretches or things like that. Like, is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, or how do you, uh, like, since, you're, since you're going from a higher pixel rate to a lower pixel rate, uh, and you're kind of compressing your image, um, what was done to kind of make sure to keep uh, like the image quality the same and make sure that you didn't lose any of the colors? Okay, so yeah, just to keep the, okay. I mean, I, I really just used uh, a lot of the, li the libraries I used were matplotlib, uh, numpy, uh, opencv, and, and there, there are many ways to do this, but I just basically used a very simple uh, resizing function from OpenCV that allowed to keep kind of the quality of our image. Um, I'm sure that it, there's a lot more that goes in depth to that, having to do with computer programming and coding and stuff like that. Uh, and if you'd like, uh, you can email me after this because it, it gets a little bit more complex uh, if you want to know the coding behind that. Uh, I'll definitely, I'd love to discuss that with you and answer that. Adam, we've right. got one more question, which is so good, I don't want to miss it. Um, Ted, who is a former TTE participant and continues to do research. And Ted asks about communities or farmers that don't have access to smartphones and that's other ways for the data. Yeah. That's a great question. So, of course, um, that's a great question. Um, of course, this is a step forward. Um, this isn't the all be all. Um, scientists, researchers, engineers uh, are trying their best. Um, this is a step forward, but we can definitely make other steps um, to kind of provide for that, uh, those communities as well. So um, 
for now, I mean, I guess you could just use the regular pH, but uh, maybe not as maybe not as accurate. But but that's that's definitely a question that that should be asked, and there should be research done uh, to provide for those communities as well. Awesome. Great job. And great job answering a difficult question. With that, we are going to move along to our final presentation with uh, bringing it home back to Oakland with Jacob. How's the screen? <clears throat> I can see it looking good. What about my voice? Can you hear it? Yep. All right. So, hello everyone. My name is Jacob Ahmed, and I'm going to be talking about liquid metal photosynthesis and simulation of atomically thin 2D nitride materials. So, why is gallium nitride important? Well, compared to the common silicon, which is what uh, the material that's mostly used today, uh, there's a couple of things larger band gap, a larger breakdown field, and a larger electron mobility. A larger band gap basically means it allows for larger breakdown voltages and it also has uh, higher thermal stability at um, higher temperatures. For larger breakdown field, that means that gallium nitride is it's more capable of supporting higher voltages before failing. And with the larger electron mobility, it's kind of in the name, electrons in gallium nitride can move faster than silicon electrons, meaning uh, higher switching frequencies. So some background, there's two sides, experimental and simulation. With the experimental side, um, you basically inject nitrogen gas into liquid gallium, which is through the air and lid at the bottom. Bubbles will then react with the liquid gallium to create uh, gallium nitride films inside the bubble. The bubble will eventually pop in the suspension fluid above in the water, and then you can just extract this by evaporating the uh, water on a silicon substrate. In the simulation side, we're using a program called COMSOL, which is a finite modeling program, and you could replicate the apparatus and input initial values to study. So in COMSOL, the model we're using, this is a 2D basic geometry. Uh, for re future reference, the blue is the water, which is represented by one on the graph scale. Two is the liquid gallium, which is the green, and three is nitrogen gas, which is the red. So what is COMSOL? Essentially, it's a simulation to mimic as closely as possible the effects that are observed in reality using finite elements, be it engineering or in the scientific context. Some of these are acoustics, you know, electromagnetics, chemical reactions, and in my case, it's fluid flow. And uh, this is a 3D representation of the 2D model. And just for future reference again, the pink purple uh, disc is the uh, gallium water interface. It's not a fluid, but it's just the interface, the border between the two. So what is the purpose of simulate, simulate? So it helps define relationships between various types of variables, parameters, and initial values. values. Uh, the, the, the bottom two gifts, the left one is a radius of 0.25 centimeters, and the right one is a radius of 0.3 centimeters. So for example, you can simulate changes in the shape of the bubble as it rises. You can see the bubble when it rises in different shapes it takes, or study the relationship between temperature and surface tension, or you can study how initial velocities affect how fast the bubble rises. So in COMSOL, there are equations that are used, the Kahn Hilliard and Navier Stokes, and we use these and couple them to model the bubble in a three phase model. Three phases meaning water, liquid, gallium, and nitrogen gas. So the Kahn Hilliard equations are used to track the moving interfaces, separating the three different phases. And the Navier Stokes equations are used to compute the velocity and pressure fields using the uh, conservation of momentum and the uh, continuity equation of, uh, of mass. So for the Kahn Hilliard equation, there's a lot of variables that you can see, but I'll highlight the most important one. It's the um, phi, which is on the very left side. I thought I had a, uh, a pointer, I guess not. Phi basically represents the different phases you're using. As you can see, I on the in the middle can take values of A, B, and C depending on the phase you're in. So phi has values between zero, zero and one depending on the phase, and that's very important because it basically separates the, the different uh, equations depending on the phases. Because most of these variables have a subscript of I, and that depends on the phase you're in. So for the Nagarius Stokes equations, the most important variables are the velocity and the pressure, pressure um, variables since they are what's computed by the equations. 
So in the in the uh, in the console, you you couple the, the equations to help simulate the flow of the three immiscible fluids while explicitly tracking the interfaces separating each pair of fluids. And these three equations are basically used to tie the kahn hilliard and the Navier-Stokes equations using domain smooth uh, equations. So the first one is the surface tension force or the volume capillary forces, and the last two are density and viscosity. So for the last two, they're smooth functions and they depend on the order parameters and always equal their corresponding equation in the I phase. For example, remember when I talked about the um, phi, the variable, that could take any value between zero and one, depending on what phase you're in. Let's take, for example, you're in uh, looking at a point in the water phase. Water is uh, denoted by the subscript A. If you're in the water phase, that value is one, and uh, the value for the order parameter for liquid gallium nitride is going to be zero because you're not in that phase. So if you try to compute the density and viscosity for that point in the water, uh, phi subscript B and phi subscript C will be zero since you're not in that phase. And then the density and viscosity would just be the density of viscosity of water. And you, that can, uh, you can do that anywhere on the domain of the model. You can even do that between you know, the two different phases. You can have two phases in one and compute the density of viscosity depending on you know, liquid gallium and water, for example. So uh, a very important parameter is the additional free bulk energy, which is denoted by that symbol. And it's, uh, it's to better optimize the model for our specific case. And a value is needed for this parameter since the default is zero. You'll know why later on. So this parameter is present in the free bulk energy equation, which was part of the um, kahn hilliard equations. And it's the last term here. And it's important, especially if any of the capillary coefficients are ever negative. And you can uh, see the equation for the capillary coefficients at the very bottom. Um, so when you try to compute the three capillary coefficients, depending on whether i is equal to a, b, or c, um, you can see that our interfacial tension values are really different, especially the nitrogen water and the gallium nitrogen. And eventually, when you try to compute, you know, the addition and subtraction of those three, you'll get a number, negative number, and that can cause a lot of problems. And you can see here, without a value for the additional free bulk energy, you get an error for the model. In one frame, this is the very first frame, everything looks fine. Second frame, things messed up. The, the model doesn't know what to do it gives us some error incorrect results and it's just no bueno so without the additional free bulk energy oh, my bad. the uh, models are unbounded from below and will cause numerical simulations to blow up in short times so what about what about when we have a value a, um, denoted by the equation the inequality you see on the, on the screen um, the variables beta and gamma are defined by the, also by the capillary coefficients, which are then defined by the surface tensions. Uh, the first frame, everything is fine. The second frame, everything is also fine. So the value, which we use is one in this case for the additional free bulk energy. Once we input that value into the model, the model begins to simulate correctly. That's good for us. So larger bubble shapes while rising, part one. Oh, give me a second. Okay. So here you can see the evolution of the bubbles as the time increases, and larger bubbles in our models exhibit interesting shapes as they rise. They look like something's pushing them from the bottom up and attempting to split the bubble in two. And on the bottom, you can see the 3D representation of the uh, evolution on the top. Uh, what is that? Well, um, turns out the bigger the bubble, the larger the volumetric buoyancy forces. And this is the, the buoyancy force is basically what's causing that jet. So the larger the buoyancy force, the larger the jet, and that buoyancy force depends on the um, viscosities and densities of our different material of our different fluids. And um, because our uh, nitrogen and liquid gallium vis viscosities and densities are so far apart and so different, we can expect a large bu buoyancy force. And this graph basically is like a uh, confirmation that this occurrence isn't just an isolated uh, event for my models. It's something that other people have dealt with as well. And that means we could, you know, go around the obstacle, I guess. So in this graph, you can see that um, on the right, you can see the different bowls and their shapes. And there's also the exhibit the same shapes that I've shown you with my models. And uh, for smaller bubbles, there are more stable. Smaller bubbles, such as the one below, the 2D evolutions and the, um, the 3Ds, uh, those have a radius of 0 0.3 centimeters, and they exhibit a shape similar to B, which is on the top left 
of the, uh, the, the, the thing. So, so that's good for us because then we could continue simulating, you know, and analyze different parameters using this model and uh, this uh, radius without, you know, any complications, especially with the, um, the splitting the bubble in two, which eventually would cause the bubble to be toroidal. Imagine like a donut, basically, with the hole in the middle. It's basically what's happening here. Uh, but there are some problems, of course, you know, as all things. Uh, some bubbles less than 0 0.25 centimeters in radius will not run correctly, and they also exhibit failures. So below is a bubble with 0 0.1 centimeters, and as the time goes on, the bubble eventually gets smaller and smaller and smaller until, you know, the model just crashes and gives us super incorrect problems, and we just can't work with that. So, so this, is, this is possibly uh, because of the imbalance between the volume and the surface area. And so more research is required to solve this problem. And what is the ideal bubble size? So depending on our, so our models are saying that smaller bubbles are more stable and more ideal to study. Realistically, smaller bubbles work better with the hypothetical physical experiment since smaller bubbles can contain uh, higher pressures and 2D materials are known to be synthesized at higher pressures. So more pressure in our bubble means a better synthesis for gallium nitride. But we can compute this uh, pressure based off our model using this contour pressure graph that comes with our model. And um, this Laplace pressure formula, which helps us compute the pressure inside the bubble, um, it's denoted by you know pressure inside minus pressure outside equals the interfacial tension between nitrogen gas and liquid gallium times the radius of, uh, radius of um, curvature of the bubble. So you can figure, you can solve for the pressure inside and use the contour pressure graph to figure out what the pressure, I mean, inside is, and then solve for the pressure um, outside. So the contour pressure graph gives you the pressure outside the bubble. Then using that, you can solve for the pressure inside. Sorry about that. Um, and also the reference for this graph is one ATM. So it's not, ex it's not as what you see, it's how much it deviates from one ATM. So, the last thing we, I did in this project was a convergence study, and that convergence study basically gives us a sense of correctness to our models, whether the results we're getting are correct or not, or sensible. And um, so, so we picked the, you know, a random variable that's important in our model, and we, and we increased the mesh elements of our models. And um, as the meshes increase, you can see that the variable kind of converges to a single point or single value. And that's good because that means our models are sensible in the results and they're correct. And that means, you know, we can continue on to keep, um, uh, uh, you know, analyzing with different uh, parameters and whatnot. Right. So future plans and questions. So along with studying pressure, there's also interest in initial velocities and relationships being between interfacial tensions and temperature. On the left is the velocity graph and on the right, you can see the borders between the different phases and that's the inter. Uh, the um, interface between the phases. That's basically it. Hope everyone learned something and um, open to questions now. Hey, Jacob. Um, when you get to yeah, that, uh, can everyone hear me? I'm having a little bit of lag, so I just want to make sure that I'm coming across clearly. I, I can hear you. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, when you get to those really small size bubbles and the simulation software starts not being able to model it, um, has there been any work done to like, or, or does the modeling software have the ability to like linearize certain forces at uh, like small scales? Like for example, um, for our NEM switch modeling software, when the beam gets really close to the contact and that uh, the distance between them shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, the electrostatic force like goes up to infinity. And so the simulation has a really hard time at that point. So what you can do in our software is you can linearize the relationship. So instead of it having an exponential increase at a certain distance, it just becomes linear and then the simulation can finish solving it and converge. And I was just wondering when you get to a really small size in the bubble, if there's a way to like linearize the forces that are acting on it so that the simulation software can solve. I think our forces are the model itself is actually already using linearized. They're already linearized and this okay. is a problem. We have, we don't know. We haven't done much research into why it's happening. I kind of, it's kind of happened last minute. I kind of skipped over it to work on other more important things. Okay. But yeah. That makes sense. In the model, it is linearized. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else? So Jacob, to build that question, I want to ask like, 
if this kind of modeling cannot work for smaller bubbles, is there any way to model these small bubbles to a much better accuracy? Yeah, I'm sure there is a way. I mean, I've, I've had a problem before, you know, not smaller bubbles, but, you know, a problem where the model won't work in a similar way. And it's just sometimes it's a parameter that we have to optimize or you know, other parts of the model that we have to fix or uh, make more um, optimized to our situation here. We haven't, uh, I haven't gone into exactly, you know, what things we can change up, but I'm sure in the future with more research that is, it could be solved. Hey, Jacob, um, very interesting darkened research. Can you go back to the slide where you showed the bubble pressure? You know, how you, how you determine the bubble pressure? This one? Yeah. <clears throat> so what, what, my, what I'm curious about is, in your case, you have a, a reaction happening. I mean, you, you form your compound. Doesn't this mean that you constantly change the conditions at the interface? Because Sorry, the, change what? So the interface is where your reaction is, is happening, I would assume. Right, right. But doesn't this mean that you don't have, you know, really stable conditions at the interface because you have a, a chemical reaction going where you constantly, you know, change the composition uh, at the interface. Right. Uh, yeah, doesn't this also cause a problem because the interfacial term basically goes into your calculation? Sorry, could you repeat the last part about the interface? So the, the gamma term in your in the Laplace uh, equation, you know, right. doesn't this doesn't this term change constantly because you have a reaction going on at the interface? Well, um... Well, this, the value we're using for this interface between liquid gallium and nitrogen gas, it's, it's based off of a specific temperature, which in our case, the model is stuck at 303.15 Kelvin. And it's also based off uh, the different properties of the two materials. We haven't gotten too specific into how the films itself, when they form, can affect this value. So far, um, in terms of how that value is affected by different things in the model, we've gone up to just the temperature and how that will affect it. So what you're looking at is just basically the two compounds right before any reaction, what happening, uh, what the, the bubble situation is. Of, of well, we, we, well we, we, we study the bubble as it rises up. So, you know, that whole, that whole event is going to have film to be produced, you know, while it goes up completely. I mean, it's, it's a very complex process. So anyway, I was just curious how you, how you look at it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, for sure. And I'm pretty sure it's, we, we might have to like, um, in the future, that might have to be considered eventually. Nice job though. Thanks. Enjoy the demo. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Before I get into the last slide. All right, so if I could give um, you all, Professor Zachariah uh, Abolishi, my mentor, Jayan Liang, my senior colleague, Sarah Susanto, guest presenters at the TTE, and TTE manager, Nicole McIntyre, and our assistants, Tony Bo Huang and Sam Mountain. So more hugs I could eventually, but unfortunately, I'll have a restraining order. Since, you know, we can all have the COVID-19 and Dr. Pelchi doesn't want that, so we gotta stay away from each other. Also, this work is funded by National Science Foundation, our EU site grant, and uh, everything is appreciated immensely. Thank you very much. Well done, Jacob. Congratulations and way to finish us strong. Congratulations to everyone. Really, really great job. And thank you to everyone in our audience who has joined. I know people have come and gone all day. As a reminder, we have our second research symposium event tomorrow, which is specifically computer science focused projects, same time, same place. Uh, and for those watching on YouTube, you can find the video for that too. And that brings us to the end of today's research symposium. I'm going to ask our interns to stay on the call, but I hope everyone has a really good rest of their day.